Mage Among Superheroes By Halosti Original ongoing lit RPG superheroes male lead sci-fi action fantasy magic. Tello is a mage. He also happens to be an orc, generally lauded as being less intelligent than humans. He was unfortunately born with the curse of the barbarian, meaning that he can't level up except through combat, which greatly hinders his ability to show he can be a proper mage. In a world with necromancers, dragons, invading armies, and all sorts of other monsters he would still be able to advance quickly, but unfortunately, that world is not his world. An unprecedented peace reigns across the land, and in the last several decades there's been little use for people capable of fighting and thus little reason for people to fight him. So when he sees a portal in his master's study he takes it, hoping to find a horde of demons or something equally foolish to combat at low level. But instead, he ends up in a strange city full of skyscrapers and people running around in colorful outfits. Superheroes, and of course supervillains as well. What dangers and opportunities could await him in such a strange and unfamiliar world? Only time will tell. Inspired by many things in the superhero genre, and super minion specifically, though while the setting will share some standard elements, it is an original setting that will hopefully be as engaging as many of the other universes. Chapter 1 Warm sun on my skin, gentle breeze, keeping the temperature just right, and just the right amount of grass, to keep me comfy. This is the life, I thought. Much better than being stuck in a stuffy library reading uncountable tedious tomes. Plus, the villagers couldn't find me here, to get their revenge. It's not that I'd done anything wrong. I was just trying to learn magic. So people didn't like getting shocked. How was that supposed to be my problem? When monsters showed up, they'd be glad I let them help me train. Sure, it had been a decade since the last monster sighting. Five decades since the last monster invasion. Clearly that meant they were hiding out, building up numbers for a massive undertaking. It wasn't possible they were actually all exterminated, right? Or, maybe there would be a war. Peace couldn't last forever. People always wanted more land and resources. Sure, there were all the lands the monsters had previously made uninhabitable, plus better farming techniques, making plots more efficient. All the free mages really did a lot for building up infrastructure inside and outside of cities. But someone had to want to start a war, right? Weren't there necromancers or something? The black cow? I frowned. Actually, the black cowl were the ones who figured out that they could conjure stone and make stone golems more easily than any form of undead, without getting anyone angry at them. I think they even learned how to use stone to flesh, to make corpses, if they wanted them. Someone had to be angry about that, right? Oh, or the Nisban Empire. They were bound to start another war once the new emperor reached his majority. No, wait. He'd signed his throne away and started a democracy or some sort of crap like that. They'd opened up their borders for trade and accepted the multicultural societies of those under their rules. A few states had sued for independence but backed out before it could go through once they realized what the young Nod Emperor could do for them if they remained. What else, what else, maybe an Orsish horde? Eh, that probably wouldn't go over well. Humans might appreciate a half-orc fighting on their side, but they'd find it harder to trust a full orc like myself. And most of the orcs had realized that starting wars wasn't doing them any good. Okay, what about disasters? No, the other mages could handle that and it wouldn't involve fighting. I could be a whaler, but I wasn't good on boats, and to be honest a good harpoon was better than anything I could do. Hunting was much the same, and all of the slots were filled by experienced hunters who knew how to keep populations at the right level. I could fight in an arena, but uh, the bloody sand pit really mostly just hosted bards these days. Being a mage sucked. How was I supposed to learn magic in a world like this? There were so many things I wanted to do, but what I actually could do right now was, limited. Tello, no surname. Level, 10. Experience, 280. Storage, plus 1. Firebolt, plus 1. Shocking Grasp, plus 3. Grease, plus 2. Force Armor, plus 4. 
Mage's Reach, plus 1. Remaining points, 1. Level 10. It might seem high, but actually until adulthood level is expected to match age. I stopped counting when the first digit of my age hit 2. It wasn't that long ago. I'm still young. But as for why my level is suboptimal, it's not my fault. I didn't always hate reading. It was nice, learning about what spells did and how they're used. The math that went into how powerful they were was interesting enough, though it was also just possible to look up huge tables if you weren't interested in calculating with a formula by hand. I was a good student, diligently studying all the time while the other students alternately studied and played. Then I started to fall behind. Because I can't get experience from reading. Aspect of the Barbarian. That's what it's actually called, but what it's called nowadays is Curse of the Barbarian. It's a curse for everyone only being able to level up by fighting sounds fine if there's fighting to do. But there isn't. I wasn't entirely crazy in my class choice, despite how I came about it. Mages have a lot of utility spells they can do. My storage spell gives me access to an extra-dimensional space which has the power to hold a book. Mage's Reach allows me to reach out with telekinetic forces as if my hand was anywhere within 30 feet or so, and if I could level up more, I would have access to all sorts of cool abilities. I should have at least four times as many points as what I've currently used. But at least I made it to level 10. Fortunately fighting doesn't require killing. However, the amount of experience depends significantly on how much of a fight it is. Being level 10 I had done the equivalent of killing 275 people without any levels or about 2,000 small animals. Just without actually killing anyone. Or dying. Or getting people angry enough to lock me out. In theory people with higher levels would be worth more, but the problem was people didn't fight. If they didn't know how to fight, they didn't count as higher level. City guards didn't want to spar with a mage since it just meant getting hard to heal injuries, and the other apprentices had more useful things to do with their time. Like building magic carriages and enchanting tools. Useful stuff. Not like fighting. To be honest, about half of my experience came from fighting Izzy. Once I could read and thus figure out I had aspect of the barbarian I picked fights wherever I could when they didn't come to me first for being an orc. I completely lost every single one of them, especially since I tried to fight teenagers when I was six. Izzy was just about my size, and she was always up for a fight. We got into scraps regularly, but as I grew older and bigger she grew, not at all. I'd assumed Izzy was a kind of funny-looking kid, but my first real friend was instead an adult halfling. That led to an awkward moment, an actual fight that didn't involve fists or magic or anything of the sort and then Izzy, just, skipped town. I wasn't really that mad, but I didn't know where she went. Okay, maybe I was mad, but I was a teenager, so it didn't really count. Most of the anger wasn't at her anyway. I was cold. Maybe I fell asleep or just got lost in thought, but it was night time. I supposed it was time to go back to the tower. At least Master Yubathar kept a place for me. I helped keep the place swept up and the books properly shelved. He knew about my struggles, and it wasn't just stubbornness that kept me the way I was. It was just that I had managed to choose my class before I learned to read. And then I spent most of the skill points I'd ever get before I realized I was young and made bad choices. It was last year that I got to level 10, and spending most of the points on Mage's Reach so I could more effectively zap people seemed like a good idea but instead it meant I had to run more. For some reason, nobody wanted to get within ten arm lengths of me. In front of me, I saw a familiar face. Blue-white hair with yellow tips, and a terrible attempt at a beard that had patches of similar colors distributed unevenly. Green skin. Tusks. It wasn't a face I saw every day. I didn't even own a mirror. But Warden's reagents had a very nice glass window out front, probably made by one of the other apprentices who actually learned a fabrication spell. I'd kind of passed over the opportunities to do so whenever they arose. It's not like I had spare points available most of the time. 
Warden had a much better beard than me, and his hair was white from age and not from magical crap changing his hair color. Tello, he folded his arms. Here to incite the town? I don't know what you mean, sir. I'm just here to pick up some reagents for Master Yubathar. Ha, huh, Warden snorted. I'd bet my whole store that you'll be chased out of Mosley within the hour. It wasn't a real bet, of course. If it had been, I probably could have stayed on the down low long enough. I could certainly control myself for an hour. If I had another couple points I could learn invisibility and that would cover five minutes on its own, which was a lot of time to reposition. It lasted about a minute per expense, and as a third level spell it cost three mana per cast. Since I was level 10, I had 15 to spend. Over the course of an hour I could regenerate maybe six points of mana, so probably seven casts, total. Maybe six because I'd be a bit short. I could tune the spell down a bit at the cost of less time. Are you going to take the goods, or just stand there? Warden asked. Right. Sorry. You've been paid already? That I have. Go on and get out. And no funny business. I wouldn't dream of it, I said as I turned and left. I left the nearly invisible form of my most recent spell behind me, expending a full three mana for Mage's Reach. Just as the door was closing I heard a yelp, so I knew my hand had gotten to him. Shocking Grasp was a dangerous spell, but I wasn't going to actually hurt people. If I turned it down to the tiniest form it not only saved mana but it acted just like a tiny static shock. It also required getting very close to people so I could touch them or a spell like Mage's Reach that allowed me to touch people from a distance. I yanked the hand with me through the still open door and began walking down the streets. It was still morning, but plenty of people were up and about. I carried my sack over one shoulder as I cast Force Armor on myself. That cost two mana at base, but it lasted almost all day, or until it broke. Since it could handle a hit hard enough to kill some people, that was good enough. Each time it broke, I just thought of it as my life being saved. People began to take notice of me. Partly because of the yelps as I passed people, and partly just because I was well known. Soon enough, I was running down the main street. Tello, people kept calling after me. Get back here. Yelling at people like that never worked, did it? Of course not. The nearly invisible hand flicked back and forth to the sides of the road, channeling the power of a shocking grasp that used about 1% of a point of mana. Too bad it couldn't be tuned up, but I didn't have that much free mana and I didn't engage in actual combat anyway. If there was one thing I could be proud of as a mage, it was that I was the fastest runner who had ever passed through Master Yuvathar's tower. I had good endurance, too. I was even pretty good at dodging. When one of the people ahead finally noticed me they tried to grab me, but I basically got out of the way and my magic armor extended far enough for them to slide off instead of getting a good grip. I was pelted by rotten fruit and small to medium rocks people were finding or had stashed nearby, but I kept running. They wouldn't chase me beyond the edge of town. Besides having better things to do once I reached the tower, they couldn't come in. They couldn't catch me before then, so I would be safe. I ran and I ran until I reached the tower door and stepped inside. Safe. I pumped my arm in excitement. Then I looked at my status. 281 experience. All of that for one measly experience point? Sure, I wasn't in lethal danger and I didn't really hurt people, but I remember the first couple of times I started similar training it gave me handfuls. At this rate I wouldn't even reach 330 and level 11 until next season at the earliest. Probably longer, because if I did this every day they'd be waiting and I'd get caught. Besides, I couldn't be sure if it was even a whole point or just enough bits of experience to push me over to the next whole point. I climbed the stairs, taking them slowly to catch my breath. Master Yuvathar's study was obviously at the top of the tower. So, despite his age, he was probably the second fastest runner that had ever studied at the tower. Still leagues below me, though. At least without magic. I knocked on his door. No response. 
well, he always had me just leave the bag on his desk. It was unlocked, so I stepped inside. Was it breezy? Did he have a window open? I turned my head as I set the sack down. The windows were in fact closed, but I found the reason for the breeze. Right there in the room about seven feet tall and maybe half as wide, not quite a proper ellipse, but wavy on the edges, was a portal. I'd never seen a portal before, but if that wasn't a portal, nothing was. It was the sort of thing that had demons or elementals or some sort of terrifying invaders from another plane about to pour through it. I couldn't see into it, instead inside the wavy edges was inky blackness. A one-way portal to some hell or something, so I stepped through it. The ground beneath my feet was dull obsidian. All around me were buildings of pallid gray stone, so smooth and continuous in their perfection they had to have been conjured by magic. The road in which I was standing, for it was clearly a road, also had strips of white at regular intervals. Those were made of, something new. Probably magic too. The smells were. Tar, maybe? Some sort of oil, and just a hint of refuse. Well, it was a demonic fortress, so it made sense. The sounds were probably the most important. Clanging and clashing metal, as well as the sound of something whooshing through the air. I turned towards it. To my credit, I immediately recast my force armor to make sure it was in top form. I just sort of forgot to dodge or move at all at the sight of a metal carriage being flung sideways through the air at me. Statistically, it wouldn't have hit me head on, probably just would have sent me flying, knocking me flat on my back and breaking four or five ribs. Through the armor. However, that didn't happen. I saw a tall, olive skinned woman. Six feet? No, at least eight feet tall, maybe ten or twelve, the way she looked as she caught the metal carriage. The force of it pushed her back shredding the dull obsidian street beneath her as she stopped the momentum of the giant projectile. Then she grew another two feet taller, her muscles bulging out to be proportionately greater than they already were, bulging through some sort of skin-tight covering. She checked the metal carriage back at the thing that had knocked it in my direction to begin with. It was some sort of earth elemental, chunky rock and dirt in vaguely humanoid shape. The woman in front of me deflated slightly, shrinking back to somewhere closer to eight feet. She turned towards me. Then she shouted something in a language I didn't speak. It didn't seem threatening or anything through, since she'd just defended me. It was a few full sentences though. I did the only thing a sane person would have done in my situation. I shot a firebolt straight into the shoulder of the earth elemental. I'd never had a chance to use a full power offensive spell except against Master Yuvathar. Even when I got the rare chance to spar with another apprentice, we reduced the power of our offensive spells. A full powered force armor with no upgrades would always withstand a firebolt or equivalent, but the hit after that usually let something through. The lower the power of an attack when a defensive spell broke, the greater available margin of error. My firebolt struck the shoulder of the creature, melting just a little bit of it. Enough for me to know that doing that 7.9 times would be a terrible waste of my mana. Shocking Grasp has more offensive power and less range, but it wouldn't be more effective on an earth elemental, maybe even less. With no other offensive spells, I cast grease at the thing's feet. An area of slick black formed atop the non-slick black pavement. It was definitely not obsidian, I could tell that as I moved. The earth elemental had caught the metal carriage, of course, and was preparing to throw it back once more. However, the sudden slippery mass under its feel made it lose its balance, and the heavy metal thing dropped on top of it. The large to larger woman in front of me took the chance to run forward and smash its head under her heel. I wasn't able to watch that whole fight because there was much more going on. There were other portals, in the air and on the ground at seemingly random positions. Someone flew in front of me, one arm outstretched, like they were in some sort of half-dive into a pool of water. Through a portal across the street from where I had moved came a steady stream of half-man-sized demons, scrawny little ones with goat hooves and horns, but otherwise human in appearance besides their red skin. Then something kicked one of them. I didn't really see it, instead, I merely saw its head swing to the side. 
I barely saw flashes of movement, and sometimes I saw the figure of a man for the briefest moment. My eyes began to pick out after images of him against the creatures as each time he was in a different pose but had clearly struck them. I thought my eyes were improving, but maybe he was just getting slower. All around there was a sort of chaos, several more flyers appearing and more monsters. Everyone seemed to have different abilities, and I had no idea what their classes were, or what their clothes were made of. The whole time, I was just trying to figure out what to fight. Then I saw dozens of bat-like creatures, man-sized, pour out of yet another portal in the sky. I was glad my portal had been one of those basically on the ground. I shot a firebolt, catching one in the chest. At least I'd had enough practice with my aim, though I wasn't confident in hitting them consistently after they spread out and were flying around towards the glass windows that seemed to be all over the buildings nearby. The one I hit charged down towards me but bats were much more flammable than rocks. It fell out of the sky onto the ground before it got to me. Mage's reach. Shocking grasp. That was my preferred spell, and I wouldn't waste the mana if I missed because it didn't discharge until it hit something. I reached for the closest bat. Lightning was very effective on them as well, stunning them and letting them crash into the ground. I targeted another, and another. One of them seemed to have caught on, but I had one more in reserve. 1.67 plus 1.9 plus 2.85 plus 1.82 plus 1.74 times 3 is equal to 13.46. All those years of arithmetic added up, and the fact that I had advanced the spells which reduced their mana costs gave a very slight edge along with weird costs. The bat went down, but then I saw two more behind it. No more mana. Well, crap. I slapped one of them with Mage's Reach while trying to push out that last half of a shocking grasp and was surprised when it sparked and sputtered like it was hit with full power. Enough that I forgot to continue dodging. Then the large size changing woman kicked it out of the air. More words, clearly directed at me. I still had no idea what they were. Crud, if only I knew a translation spell. It was too bad I didn't have any points available. Except. I suddenly had more mana. Had I leveled up? A quick check told me I had. I probably needed that, right? What was it, third level? Translate. I kind of knew how it worked already. I purchased it and cast it. I tried to cast it. Of course, I was still out of mana. Less than a single point remaining, if my calculations were correct. So I skimped. Downcasting worked pretty well, usually. What the hell is that? Ugh, it was missing words. The intimidating woman stood taller and wider than me, even as a full-grown orc. I should probably say something. Don't speak, good. Tired. Hells, was that the best I could get out? What a terrible first impression. Safe dash she pointed down the street. I nodded. I probably needed to leave. What a stupid mistake. I couldn't even cast a translation spell properly right now. I was about to pass out from mana exhaustion too. I staggered away. At least she hadn't attacked me. I had thought a random orc appearing out of a portal would have concerned people more, but there were already so many portals. Uh, she probably didn't see I came from one. Maybe that should remain secret. Most of the things were aggressive. Though I couldn't explain anything at the current moment anyway. Chapter 2 Perhaps I was prone to making rash decisions. Deciding that I should be a mage just because someone said orcs were too stupid to do it was a bit rash. The people who said it would have deserved it if I firebolted them in the face. Sure, that would have made me the angry, violent orc, but humans made me that way. I don't think I acted more angrily or violently than they would have in the same circumstances. But while I didn't think it was fair to call me angry or violent or stupid, calling me reckless was probably appropriate. Going through the portal to find things to fight so I could level up made sense. I was willing to deal with the danger, though clearly not ready to handle as much of it as appeared. The problem was with the rest. I was on a strange plane I had never heard of. 
The city I was in was populated mainly by humans, or at least something so close I couldn't tell the difference. I didn't speak the language without magic and I was out of mana. I didn't know how to buy food or shelter. I also didn't know that the road I was on had magic carriages that went extremely fast. Not until I heard one make a loud noise, its driver spouting what was certainly profanity as it swerved around me from behind. Lesson learned the black pavement was for those. Gray pavement was for walking. More magic carriages crossed my path the further I went, and more people. I got strange looks. Mostly curious, some suspicious, but none outright hostile. I wanted to ask someone for directions or something, but I had to wait a full thirty minutes to recover enough mana to cast a full translation spell instead of a quarter-assed one. I saw a few people who weren't humans. What they were I couldn't tell but they didn't seem to be orcs, elves, dwarves, gnomes, halflings, demons, fey, anything I knew of. What plane was this? Humans weren't so dominant on any plane, but the material, were they? I should have heard about it. People with masks and weird colorful clothing occasionally passed by. Several of them gave a standard greeting, which I returned. Good day, citizen. A man snickered. Was my accent off because of the weak magic? Well, at least mirth was an acceptable outcome to social interactions. I had three problems. Problem number one. This plane did not speak common for some reason. I wasn't even aware of a place that was so deviant in their languages. In fact, I saw a number of written languages that were completely unlike what I was used to and unlike each other. The translation spell worked. Given half an hour of walking the streets I regained enough mana for a full-powered translation spell that would function properly, and last long enough that I could still end up recovering mana for other uses given time. Once I looked at the varying written languages I was even more certain that they were different. The way the spell translated them was different, and I got different amounts of meaning from each character or symbolic word. It didn't give me enough understanding to replicate things without the spell functioning but I understood the full spread of variability. I saw at least a dozen languages and overheard a few being spoken in the first half hour. Greeting citizen. That time, it wasn't me saying it. I figured out it was weird. I waved to the hero even as I kept well to my side of the sidewalk. Heroes were the people in colorful apparel and masks. Though there were also villains who dressed similarly and were more malicious. I understood the meaning of the word just fine, and I saw on a magic box people talking about where I had come through. Some sort of Dr. Doomsday with a dimensionatron. I wasn't comfortable with how to determine hero from villain right away, so I steered clear of both. I either didn't encounter any villains, or they found me beneath their notice. That was fine with me, for the moment. I had no idea what level anyone was, but with all the fighting and magic I saw earlier it had to be high. Everyone could get experience from fighting, I just got more, and was restricted to it as my only avenue for advancement. Problem number two. My stomach growled to remind me it was still hungry. I was not concerned about my ability to find food. All I had to do was close my eyes, spin around randomly, then point. I would probably be pointing at a dining establishment or street cart selling food. I required sustenance. In a similar vein, I needed rest. Magic made one tired and hungry. I could spend the night outdoors, but I did not find the idea agreeable. I could, yes, I had enough points to learn the temperate zone spell. I would not die of exposure, at least. My eyes scanned the nearby buildings. Hotel. That name didn't quite translate, but I felt it had the same meaning as the holy day in next to it. I wasn't sure if there were enough holy days to merit an establishment catering exclusively to pilgrims, but this new plane was strange enough that it might be possible. Thus, with establishments found that could sate my hunger and my need for shelter, I was saved. If not for Problem number three It was difficult to tell the expense of dining establishments. I decided to enter one where I saw one of the non-human individuals carrying some sort of food and drink out. It seemed to have the food readily available, and I hoped cheaply available. 
I didn't exactly have a job here. The door chimed a bell when I opened it, but it had done the same as the other patron exited. How much for one of those? I pointed to some sort of sausage behind glass, glass seemed to be everywhere. Perhaps this whole city was extremely wealthy and the prices inflated beyond belief. The granny behind the counter pointed up and behind her. The prices are there. I looked. I wasn't sure what prices were what. I didn't see any corn, but apparently a corn dog was point three more than a hot dog. That was point three out of one dollar and forty nine cents and one dollar and seventy nine cents, respectively. But what was a dollar? Copper? Silver? There was no way it was gold or platinum. I didn't have coins that could be broken into such precise pieces. I took out a copper. How much is this worth? The old lady took it and looked, squinting her eyes. Then she put some sort of glass things on her face. Goggles? Was the coin hot or bright or something? Maybe she'd be using an identification or weight calculating spell. Sorry, Sonny, I can't accept foreign currency. Oh. Why not? The weight of coins was pretty standard. Even if this plane was different, she should at least have scales to measure. I found myself shoved to the side unceremoniously. A large man slapped the counter. Cigarettes. I had no idea what that word meant, but it sounded like a threat. I was just about ready to fight, but the old lady harumphed. And pulled something out. I noticed she took some sort of paper the man had plopped onto the counter along with his hands. A number appeared like magic on a surface in front of us. Then she opened a drawer and placed the paper inside, pulling out several other papers and some coins. My jaw dropped to the floor. There were big silver coins, a second size of silver coins, even smaller copper coins, and further truly minuscule silver coins. The man got some of each and some notes. I couldn't work out the value of the coins, but based on the paper saying ten and the magic thing saying five, whereupon he received in return four papers marked one and coins, a paper was a dollar. A dollar, translation said. A paper marked ten was therefore ten dollars. What you looking at, Mutie? The large man was quite a bit wider than me, though only minorly taller. I had accidentally been staring at him and the money. I turned away. He walked outside. I heard the door chime as he left. What an asshole, said the old lady behind the counter. Best stay away from folk like him, give Nube a bad name. Why don't you head down to the bank and exchange your money? I can tell you just got in. You from Uck? What? I asked. Sorry. UK. No. Hmm, guess I was wrong. About that bank? I asked. Where is it? Just down the road. Go under the freeway and hang a left at Patter. Right. She at least pointed. I wasn't too bad with directions. I stepped out of the store that appeared to be a roundabout way to say negative four. Numbers seemed pretty consistent between languages. Though I hadn't seen that many, problem number four, something hit me in the back of the head. Hard. Like, hard enough to kill a man. I know, because my armor shattered and I still felt a strong blow. I fell forward onto my face and it took a moment to get my bearings. I just managed to roll over and cast the force armor spell again when a mace slammed into the ground where I had been a moment before. It was the man who had been at the store. The one who bought cigarettes and called me a mutie. Perhaps a cigarette was the thing in his mouth? He spit it at me, right into my eye. I blinked. It had no force or real heat, but it was reflexive. He swung the strange mace, which was like a fully metal and extra thick truncheon. It hit me, but I was half ready. I blocked with my arms and relaxed them to soften the blow slightly. My armor didn't shatter, but it was close. The most dangerous result, really. I leapt to my feet and swiped my hand at the man. Shocking grasp was at full power. I didn't sense any magical defenses from the man, but I didn't really care. 
I had to live. He raised one arm to block my hand. I still hit his arm, and the spell released to full effect. The man spasmed and twitched and fell over onto his back. I stood over him for a moment, wondering what to do. Freeze, a voice yelled. You're coming with me. I turned towards the voice. Someone in a uniform. Not a hero. Nor a villain. Someone with an uncovered face. Police, read something on his chest. Some sort of city guard, if I surmised correctly. Don't even think about it. My partner's watching and super backup is already on the way. I hadn't actually thought about much of anything. He attacked me. I was just defending myself, tell that to the interrogators. I narrowed my eyes. What? I mean it. I saw you two fighting. I have to bring you both in for questioning. Don't worry, we're not going to discriminate against you on account of your differences. I found that unlikely. But the way he was holding that metal thing in front of him indicated it was a weapon of some sort. I did have the points to learn an extremely short-range teleport if things went haywire. Assuming they didn't stick me in an anti-magic prison. Yet while there was clearly magic in this place, I hadn't felt any enchanted buildings. Fine. I will comply. Hands out in front of you. I complied. Wrists together. As I did so, he put on shackles. Very thin shackles that locked themselves. Magically enhanced, probably. So much for that escape thing. Where's the stun gun? The what? I asked. The stun gun. I don't know, I said. Maybe it fell. I had no idea what it was, but saying that might not help. The man looked over me. Couldn't hide it in those pockets. Stand over by that while there, while I check that guy on the ground. I didn't bother to inform him that I could probably hide many things, though not actually in my pockets. He kneeled next to the man, then pulled out a wand and waved it over him. Was he a healing mage? No, if he needed a wand it was probably a power of the wand. Except the man didn't get up, and the wand just made a strange noise. Yeah yeah, I know. He held his hand to his chest, can we get a medic? Then there was a bunch of jargon, possibly an explanation of our location. Was he talking to himself, or, magic? More magic. I knew there were spells to communicate long distance, but enchanting something to repeatedly use that magic seemed expensive. Without noticing, a man with biceps the size of my torso had appeared. He had a mask. A hero. Unfortunately, I didn't think he was here to rescue me. Just stay right there. I did. I doubted my armor spell would prevent a slap from him in its current condition, or even if it was at full power, to be honest. He was a super, which probably meant someone with a combat class. Did that mean the police weren't a combat class, then? Strange. I was put into the back of a car a short while later. The man who was apparently the partner of the first police began driving the magical carriage with a strange wheel and some pedals at his feet. He did not appear interested in conversation, and I decided to allow him silence from behind the shielded separator between front and back. Mage Among Superheroes Chapter 2 I arrived at the police place very quickly, despite all of the stops behind other vehicles. The ability of the magic carriage to accelerate and decelerate with ease was impressive. I was led inside. First my pockets were emptied I had stored my money pouch in the carriage so there wasn't much but lint into an almost empty room with a sturdy table and chairs. Interrogator will be with you soon, said one of the police as they ominously slammed the door. My eyes scanned the walls, floor, and even ceiling. No signs of blood, no restraints except the thin manacles on my wrists. Just a single magic torch hanging from the ceiling providing an actually quite substantial amount of light. Soon I was bored. My brain had already gone through all the possibilities I could think of, and I was prepared to quickly pick the short-range teleport and go. It would be hard with the manacles inhibiting my magic, however. I wished I could just cast storage and dash. It worked. 
Crap. Crop. Why the hell did it work? Sure, I seriously tried to do the spell, but it wasn't supposed to work. I cast storage again. I now had the manacles, but I couldn't slip my hands into them. I held it under the table. This was bad. I considered just trying to teleport out. Maybe they didn't know I was a mage. Maybe they thought I was some sort of shocky, guy. Who did that without magic? The chair was too hard and I was constantly squirming in it by the time the woman came in. She was starting to show gray hair, but she didn't have all of the equipment of the other police. Like that thing I presumed was a weapon. She said something I didn't understand. Crap, translation wore off. I cast it again, quickly. Sorry, can you repeat that? I did my best to smile, though I worried it just emphasized my tusks. Hands on the table, please. I hesitated for a moment. Then I held up the manacles. Um. Oh good, the woman said. They usually forget to take them off. I'm sure you're smarter than to try something in here, with the cameras watching. I didn't know what sort of thing a camera was, but I should have expected invisible creatures. No wonder the room was so big. I was surrounded by guards the whole time, and I was supposed to have my manacles removed. I set them on the table. First your rights. I'm Miranda, by the way. She chuckled at some joke I didn't understand, then read a list of things. We don't actually have to say all that since you're not at the moment being charged, but it's tradition. Now then, we'll go over some questions one at a time. What happened? I took a moment to compose a reply. I was walking along the street and that man hit me in the back of the head with a mace. He tried to do it again when I was on the ground, then I shocked him to make him stop. I really hoped magic wasn't illegal here without a permit of some kind. I didn't bring my license from home, and I seriously doubted it would work on this plane. A mace, she said. You mean a bat? Oh, yes. Like a metal baton. She nodded. What happened to the stun gun? Miranda asked. I guess it was time. I don't know what a stun gun is, I admitted. The thing you shocked him with. I just used magic, I said. Oh. A super? You registered? No. Lying about that would be proven wrong very quickly, fine. She looked down at a shiny plate in her hand I'd been too worried to really look at. I could see text, but reading it upside down was hard even with translation going. You went a little hard on the guy. I understand it's hard to control in stressful situations, but if you did any more he'd probably have a heart attack. So next time keep it toned down. Next time? I asked. Well, she shrugged. Hopefully there won't be a next time. But if you decide to take up heroing, you need to make sure to know people's limits. I know human limits. I just assumed he would have more durability because of his warrior class. But also I didn't want to die, so I wasn't thinking about it all that hard. There was some confusion in her look. The words translated, but the meaning clearly didn't get through. She shook her head. We noticed you didn't have any ID. What's your name? Tello. Tello what? Just Tello. I haven't earned a surname. I sure earned the name instigator though. Where's your ID? I don't know what that is. ID? Identification? Oh. A simple abbreviation, but unfamiliar because of the language barrier. Those letters had no meaning to me except as part of a word. It's at home, probably. Can you call someone? Get them to send us a picture of it? I don't know a calling spell. Nor do I know any artists. I don't know how to get home. Wait, what, she frowned. Did you come through a portal? We can send you home if your part in this checks out. Yes, I did. Can you tell us where you're from? I don't recognize the accent. It's pretty close, but... Granbold, I said. She looked down at the thing in her hand, pressing her finger to it. Can you spell it? 
I did. Not that it helped. Sorry, I don't recognize the language. Does nobody on this plane speak common? Common what? she asked. The word translated, but, the meaning clearly didn't. How could she not know about common? Just. Common. The language. I'm not finding anything on that. You from a small place? There was a beep from the thing in her hand. Never mind, I'll get the right person in here for this later. Just sit tight for a bit, gonna go talk to the other guy. It'll be quick. I doubted it would be. I was wrong. Talking to the other guy was very quick. Then Miranda was back with someone else and something that smelled good. Guy's an idiot, she said. But he corroborated your story in his own way. Speaking of which, is your head okay? I touched the back of my head. Only slightly sore. I nodded. I've had worse. She grimaced. Sorry to hear that. We'll get a medic to look at it in a second. She gestured to the young man next to her. Ollie, here knows every country, heck, every city if it's been around more than a day or two. He should be able to help you out. My stomach growled. I was embarrassed, but Ollie held out a box he was carrying with him. Here. Donuts. They'll make you feel better. I opened the box a strange thin box that I almost tore on accident. Inside were some sort of pastry. I took one out and bit into it. It was gone in three bites. Delicious. Thank you. You can have more, Ollie said. I did, taking smaller bites, but still devouring one in moments, so Miranda didn't recognize the name of your home. Could you tell me? Granbold, I said. City or country? Country. Ollie frowned. Sounds like a name from out east, but not a country. Where is it? He held up one of the same sorts of things as Miranda had. It showed something like a map. I looked at it for a moment, but didn't recognize anything. The language was still wrong. It's on the material plane, so you might not have heard of it here. I didn't even know about anything like, this place. Ollie looked at me, squinted, then turned to Miranda. He held out his hands, to the side. So, uh. This isn't my department. We got a call extra. He leaned a little closer, but didn't really whisper, that quietly. Maybe get that medic in here too. Not sure what all that sugar will do to an alien. So I was also going to find out what extra was. What were they more of? More security? Because I hadn't done anything but disappear, my handcuffs, and they didn't even seem to notice that. Extra apparently stood for extraterrestrial affairs, and also extradimensional affairs. So really, that was the right people to call. I just didn't know that sort of person existed, or I might have already brought them up. There were a pair of them. A little green man who was clearly not a goblin with that overly large head and similarly oversized black eyes, and an angel. A woman with pure white wings sprouting from her back, at least, and not a hint of bird beyond that. Both of them had white shirts with buttons down the front and pants of unfamiliar light brown material. The first thing they did was order the others out of the room. Miranda and Ollie left, but the donut stayed. I didn't taste nuts at all, but the dough was quite pleasantly sweet. We're under the impression that you are new on Earth, but that you also speak the language. This plane is called Earth? I asked. Isn't that redundant or confusing? Just a point of clarification. The little green man held up some sort of flat magical device and what must have been a writing implement. You do mean plane and not planet, right? Of course, I agreed. How would I even get to a different planet? The pair looked at each other and shook their heads like I said something strange. We should introduce ourselves. You're Tullo? I nodded. The woman inclined her head, I'm Malalial. Zorfax, the little green man, bowed slightly. You already said it, but I'm Tello, I offered my hand. I wasn't sure if it was appropriate or if they even shook hands on this plane, but each of them in turn shook it. 
They were friendly enough, but I felt like I was being judged. Not that they were really hiding it. Somewhere that his handshakes, Zorfax stroked his chin, not looking like it's you, Malaliel smiled. Could be. Given his features. We should just ask. Malaliel looked straight at me. How did you get to Earth? I came here through a portal I found. The police already knew that, but perhaps they hadn't had the chance to share that information. Or they wanted confirmation. You said you don't know how you would get to a different planet? A portal would do it, Malaliel explained. Really? That sounds really difficult. Planets are far. Getting to another plane should be easier. I assure you, Zorfax said, it is not. Oh. A simple abbreviation, but unfamiliar, because of the language barrier. Those letters had no meaning to me except as part of a word. It's at home, probably. Can you call someone? Get them to send us a picture of it? I don't know a calling spell. Nor do I know any artists. I don't know how to get home. Wait, what? She frowned. Did you come through a portal? We can send you home if your part in this checks out. Yes, I did. Can you tell us where you're from? I don't recognize the accent. It's pretty close, but... Granbold, I said. She looked down at the thing in her hand, pressing her finger to it. Can you spell it? I did. Not that it helped. Sorry, I don't recognize the language. Does nobody on this plane speak common? Common what? she asked. The word translated, but, the meaning clearly didn't. How could she not know about common? Just. Common. The language. I'm not finding anything on that. You from a small place? There was a beep from the thing in her hand. Never mind, I'll get the right person in here for this later. Just sit tight for a bit, gonna go talk to the other guy. It'll be quick. I doubted it would be. I was wrong. Talking to the other guy was very quick. Then Miranda was back with someone else and something that smelled good. Guy's an idiot, she said. But he corroborated your story in his own way. Speaking of which, is your head okay? I touched the back of my head. Only slightly sore. I nodded. I've had worse. She grimaced. Sorry to hear that. We'll get a medic to look at it in a second. She gestured to the young man next to her. Ollie, here knows every country. Heck, every city if it's been around more than a day or two. He should be able to help you out. My stomach growled. I was embarrassed, but Ollie held out a box he was carrying with him. Here. Donuts. They'll make you feel better. I opened the box a strange thin box that I almost tore on accident. Inside were some sort of pastry. I took one out and bit into it. It was gone in three bites. Delicious. Thank you. You can have more, Ollie said. I did, taking smaller bites, but still devouring one in moments, so Miranda didn't recognize the name of your home. Could you tell me? Granbold, I said. City or country? Country. Ollie frowned. Sounds like a name from out east, but not a country. Where is it? He held up one of the same sorts of things as Miranda had. It showed something like a map. I looked at it for a moment, but didn't recognize anything. The language was still wrong. It's on the material plane, so you might not have heard of it here. I didn't even know about anything like, this place. Ollie looked at me, squinted, then turned to Miranda. He held out his hands, to the side. So, uh. This isn't my department. We got a call extra. He leaned a little closer, but didn't really whisper, that quietly. Maybe get that medic in here too. Not sure what all that sugar will do to an alien. So I was also going to find out what extra was. What were they more of? More security? Because I hadn't done anything but disappear, my handcuffs, and they didn't even seem to notice that. Extra apparently stood for extraterrestrial affairs, 
and also extra-dimensional affairs. So really, that was the right people to call. I just didn't know that sort of person existed, or I might have already brought them up. There were a pair of them. A little green man who was clearly not a goblin with that overly large head and similarly oversized black eyes, and an angel. A woman with pure white wings sprouting from her back, at least, and not a hint of bird beyond that. Both of them had white shirts with buttons down the front and pants of unfamiliar light brown material. The first thing they did was order the others out of the room. Miranda and Ollie left, but the donut stayed. I didn't taste nuts at all, but the dough was quite pleasantly sweet. We're under the impression that you are new on Earth, but that you also speak the language. This plane is called Earth? I asked. Isn't that redundant or confusing? Just a point of clarification, the little green man held up some sort of flat magical device and what must have been a writing implement. You do mean plane and not planet, right? Of course, I agreed. How would I even get to a different planet? The pair looked at each other and shook their heads like I said something strange. We should introduce ourselves. You're Tello? I nodded. The woman inclined her head, I'm Malalial. Zorfax, the little green man, bowed slightly. You already said it, but I'm Tello, I offered my hand. I wasn't sure if it was appropriate or if they even shook hands on this plane, but each of them in turn shook it. They were friendly enough, but I felt like I was being judged. Not that they were really hiding it. Somewhere that his handshakes, Zorfax stroked his chin, not looking like it's you, Malalial smiled. Could be. Given his features. We should just ask. Malalial looked straight at me. How did you get to Earth? I came here through a portal I found. The police already knew that, but perhaps they hadn't had the chance to share that information. Or they wanted confirmation. You said you don't know how you would get to a different planet? A portal would do it, Malalial explained. Really? That sounds really difficult. Planets are far. Getting to another plane should be easier. I assure you, Zorfax said, it is not. I shrugged, I guess I won't be getting back to the material plane soon then. Zorfax narrowed his eyes at the statement, unseen eyelids appearing over his otherwise perfectly round eyes. That terminology. You recognize the planet? Malalial asked. No. It's something else. He should be extra-dimensional. But we should focus. You came through a portal, Tello. What next? There was a battle around me. Then I walked along the streets for a while. I eventually stepped into a store and was attacked after I came out. Then I came here, right? Zorfax looked at the thing in his hands, where I could see some text, though not well enough to read it from my angle. It says here you used a stun gun on someone, but the arresting officer couldn't find it. Is that a natural ability? Ah, you don't have to answer. We respect your privacy as long as you control your abilities, but we might be able to help you if you share information. It's not a gun. It's magic, I clarified. Magic? Malalial asked. Yes. From my mage class. Malalial frowned, your dimension has a class system? Yes, of course. She shook her head. How terrible. Extra-dimensional affairs is capable of offering you refugee status to flee the class system. Actually, Zorfax started, I don't think he, he shook his head. Never mind. It's a good idea. What does refugee status mean? I asked. I mean, I know what a refugee is, but what does it mean on this plane? You'll get an identification allowing you to legally work and live here with certain provisions, such as that you are not fleeing from criminal charges, Malalial explained, except if those charges are for political or religious beliefs, it will take some time to explain in full. But though you ended up here on your first day, that won't be held against you. Especially considering what we've heard. You're already exonerated of potential charges. We thought it best to take care of business here first. He checks out? Zorfax asked. 
He has not been lying, Malaliel said. I wondered how she would know. I hadn't seen her cast a spell. The only issue is his point of origin. You have knowledge of extra-dimensional travel, but not here, correct? Right, I confirmed. Since you don't seem to know the material plane, where is this in relation to the elemental planes? The heavens? Hells? Abyss? Malaliel shook her head, but Zorfax held his device up for her to read. Pretty sure he's a type F. That would explain the confusion. Oh, she nodded. Oh. I see. Cross-dimensional inspiration. She put on her best smile and turned towards me. Well then, I'm sure you still have many questions. If you could come with us to the office, we can explain everything and help you out. It might take some time, but I assure you it's quite necessary. Chapter 4 With little choice available nor reason to ignore people that seemed like they were trying to help, I went with the small, green, non-goblin man with the large black eyes and the angel. If Malaliel really was an angel and I hadn't asked yet, then she should want to help me. Though I might have technically broken some laws, even if I was defending myself. There was no reason for them to lie to me about how things were going, though. If they wanted to lock me up, they could just bring in a super and tell me to handcuff myself. What was I going to do about it? Not much, as a level 11. Though strangely they hadn't even asked what level I was. The most important part was they let me take the donuts with me. I didn't need more of them, but it was hard to not just munch on them. I hardly ever got to eat pastries back home, and there were so many interesting flavors. Brown, light brown, red, speckled. I honestly didn't recognize most of the flavors, but all had a sweetness to them. We got into another magic carriage, this time with markings, four extra, instead of police and no black and white pattern. I couldn't help but notice how many other magic carriages were around, some just sitting in the underground storage area, and others on the roads. This city must be wealthy, I commented. You're right, Zorfax answered. But it comes with a lot of trouble too. Lots of people want to take it through improper means. Even at a very small percentage of the population it's a great many people. There's around, 30 million people here now, I think. That's, a lot of people in one city. It's a big city, he answered. I supposed, that was right. After all, we traveled at a rather quick pace even with frequent stops, and the city still stretched on forever in every direction. Soon enough we came to another large tower, everything was towers, but some of them were skinny, and some of them were wide. Once more we drove underground to a guarded magical carriage storage facility. Instead of taking stairs, however, we stepped into a small room. There was an area that had labeled numbers, as well as some starting with B1, B2, etc. Zorfax hit the one labeled one. It had a star next to it, which probably meant something. I stumbled as the room shook. Was it some sort of teleportation box? Neither Zorfax nor Malaliel seemed concerned about the shaking, but I was pretty sure teleportation was supposed to be steady. Then again, I could never afford to use those services. When the door slid open a few moments later, we were indeed somewhere else. If I was correct and we were in the same tower, the teleportation was actually surprisingly slow. Perhaps it was cheaper that way. Even if New Bay was a wealthy city, there had to be a limit to how much teleportation they had available. We were in a huge room with the biggest variety in types of people I had ever seen. I was used to humans, elves, dwarves, halflings, and of course orcs like myself, but the only kind I saw many of was humans, and the rest of the people filling up the area I didn't recognize. There had to be at least a few dozen wildly different body types, from small to large, different skin colors, and occasionally entirely different limb configurations. I wasn't sure if the tendrils trailing from one of the people's back actually counted as a limb, but I saw two, three and four arms as well as someone with an extra pair of legs. The four-armed ones reminded me of a kind of demon, though I had to admit I'd never seen any in person and they didn't quite match. The way everyone was waiting in neat lines indicated that everyone was willing to comply with the local laws. 
certainly not the chaotic and overbearing nature that demons were said to have. It was supposed to be a core of their being, so either the information I had was untrue, or none of those present were actually demons. This way, Malalial gestured, normally you'd need to wait in line, but given your circumstances we'll need to process you directly to avoid problems. So I followed, hoping that processing wasn't too painful. There it was, once again. It had been many years since she set her eyes on Mosley and the mage's tower outside its walls. Izzy stood proudly at her full height as she laid her eyes on the town. Then she lowered herself. It might be better to check out the situation instead of just assuming everything had resolved itself. Or she could just pass on by. She didn't have to enter, Tullo might not even live in Mosley anymore. And, they weren't even really friends anymore anyway. You just gonna stand there? The guard outside the gate asked. Were you gonna come in? Gates close in an hour. I'm not going to just stand around for an hour, Izzy said, offended. I might have believed you an hour ago, the guard shrugged, but then you just nervously bounced on your toes trying to peek into the city. You can just go inside. At first, the guard had found her suspicious. But after checking if there was a bounty or something on her and watching her pace nervously without focusing on anything in particular, it just seemed like someone nervous to come to a new place. Izzy walked into town. The streets were familiar, basically the same as they had been. Not that they would have had reason to change. The world was relaxed, and so too had been her lifestyle. She would do enough running about town delivering messages and packages to get by, and spend the rest of her time doing pretty much nothing at all. That was the life, no point working yourself to death for no reason. That thought reminded her she had something to deliver. She should go do that first. Wouldn't want to be late on the delivery, and they might want it before morning. So she headed to Warden's reagents. She wasn't sure what all the smelly herbs she was delivering were for, but the pouches were all labeled. She walked up to the counter and hopped up on the half-stool meant for people of her size to properly see and interact. Delivery for you, Warden, she called out. The gray-haired man stepped out of the back, where the door had been open. Finally. I ordered that stuff a week ago. Izzy shrugged. I just picked it up yesterday. Not my fault. She held out the order. He looked at it and nodded, then signed his receipt as he handed over his portion of her fee. The rest would be paid upon return to the messenger's guild. Izzy left the delivery on the counter and walked to the door. Just as she was opening it, Warden called after her. Say, don't I recognize you? I used to live here, she said as she let the door close behind her. Now, what else did she have to do? Ah yes. She should secure a place of accommodation. She wouldn't want to find out every place was fully booked. She made her way over to the Bumpy Chandler Inn. Mosley didn't exactly have an abundance of inns, and while the Bumpy Chandler wasn't the best name, the rooms had been just fine. She greeted the old woman standing behind the counter. Hello. Do you have any rooms available? Of course, the old woman smiled. Two silvers a night. Three with meals. A reasonable enough price. She handed over the three silvers and got a key in return. That's the first room on the second level. Would you like your meal now? Yes, Izzy nodded. She deserved a good rest after walking all day. She climbed up a tall stool at one of the tables, and it wasn't long before a large bowl of stew was placed in front of her, by the same kindly old woman. Good. It seemed this place understood that halfling portions shouldn't be smaller than human portions. It took a lot of energy to keep moving all day, even if she barely had any chub to maintain like some. She wolfed down the stew, she had to admit that the one thing she wished was more her sized was the spoon, but at least its size allowed her to theoretically blow on more of it at once to help it cool. Of course, she just ended up with a scalded mouth, but it was worth it at least while the flavor lingered. Later she would likely regret her haste. But she'd had to eat quick, the gates were going to close, after all. But no matter how much she'd tried, she just hadn't been able to complete everything in time. Yep, yeah, 
she'd just have to wait until tomorrow morning to visit the mage's tower, no helping it. What do you mean he's gone? Izzy exclaimed. Where did he go? He has to have told you. Master Yuvathar sighed. I was attempting to explain. Now, if you would let me. Izzy nodded grumpily. If you might notice, there are some unexpected magical signatures here in the room. I recognized Tullo, and I can assure you he was here because, he held up a familiar pouch, he delivered my acquisition from Rordans. Besides, there are lingering traces of spells I recognize from him. Master Yuvathar's back was beginning to bend in his old age, but he still stood much taller than Izzy. He walked past her over to a corner of his office. Here, there are clear remnants of a powerful spell. Far beyond his capabilities and without his signature. I see marks on the floor, Izzy nodded. And even I can feel the lingering traces of powerful magic there. So what, you're saying he was just, disintegrated? I said nothing of the sort, Yuvathar shook his head. I said that he is gone, this has all of the signatures of transportation magic, though through a means I am unfamiliar with. I took careful notes and have sent for some of my colleagues most familiar with that sort of magic. I am quite perturbed that such a thing could appear in my office and abduct one of my most passionate students, so you're going to make a portal to bring him back right? I wish I could say that was within my capabilities, but as I said I have colleagues who specialize in that area. But even if they figure out where he was sent to, it is an entirely different matter to open a portal there, and even if the precise location is somehow divined there is no guarantee that Tullo will be there waiting. But why wouldn't he wait for us to bring him back? Izzy asked. I do believe you knew him, did you not? Yuvathar raised an eyebrow. When have you ever known him to sit still for a single moment? With that curse, it's hard to blame him. Reaping no rewards for studying for hours on end isn't a pleasant thought. He did as much as could be expected of him. Yuvathar shook his head, if I thought him a little more reckless, I might have suspected he threw himself into whatever portal appeared here on purpose. But why? Izzy asked. Didn't he have things he wanted here? Like, learning from you. And what about his friends? He learned all that I could reasonably teach him, Yuvathar shook his head. There's not much else he could achieve without knowing more spells, and that would require more levels. As for friends, he didn't have any. I was his friend, Izzy hung her head. Sure, it was true that last time they'd met many years before there had been some words between them. And maybe she hadn't made her thoughts clear or explained why she was going. Or sent him a letter. But he should have known she would be coming back. Somehow. But you'll bring him back, right? As I said, I don't have the expertise. Even my colleagues who do might not be willing to make the attempt. Depending on what happened, creating a portal could be very expensive. At the very least it might cost hundreds of golds. Izzy reached down for her pocket, which had somewhere around ten gold coins in it. That was enough for her to survive for several months without working, if she was conservative with her spending. She knew magic could be expensive, but it was hard to believe it might cost many times that. It might be easy though, right? Izzy said. He could have been taken somewhere nearby, then we could just go find him. Yes, Yuvathar said. If that is the case, I'm sure you'll be able to meet him again soon. But I wouldn't count on it. Chapter 5 There were so many interesting people to look at around Extra HQ, so many strange things in the wide open room, presumably related to all of the people coming through. I saw a few people step out of a big orb without anybody entering, perhaps some sort of portal? I could have spent hours looking at the giant hourglass and the various spinning things or the aquatic section where they had a whole office flooded with water. Of course, I spent most of my time in extra HQ in a boring room. Sorry, I don't have one of the outside rooms to give you a view of the bay, Zorfax said. Too much light gives me a headache. Malaliel had been called away for something else I was betting on truth reading abilities, but I couldn't be sure. Though apparently I was in her department I was physically in Zorfax's office with an assistant helping. The dark-skinned, bespectacled assistant was printing and filling out papers. 
Here on Earth I'd seen a much larger number of people with glasses and goggles and the like, instead of just weird artificers. They had huge glass windows too. I wondered who made those, since I hadn't seen any craftsmen or forges of any sort as we moved through the city. Maybe they were just sealed inside with all of the heat instead of having it open? That seemed extremely unpleasant. Type F, you said, the assistant confirmed. He had a little thing on his chest which said Basant, which I determined was his name. That's right Basant, Zorfax said as he pressed buttons that seemed to interact with a large magic square in front of him. It was a different sort from the one they'd had at the police station which could be held in the hand. Superpowers? Magic, I corrected. MHM, Basant nodded his head. Speaks English. That's also magic, I pointed out. I mostly speak common and like half of Orsish. Is there a limit to your communication magic? Zorfax asked. It's magic so, it's limited by mana. But I can regenerate more than it uses if I'm not doing anything else. I shook my head, I don't understand words that represent things I haven't heard of before. I'll mark that as a working understanding, the assistant said. Can you read and write? Yes. Translation was a powerful spell. It cost more than any of my combat spells to use, so it wasn't crazy. Of course, it also lasted for a significant duration. The assistant moved on to the next thing, any training in a trade or profession? I didn't pick a trade class, I answered. Got it. Not sure if skills from a type F would translate anyway. Is type F good or bad? I asked. I understood that was a letter in their alphabet, but I had no idea where it was placed. Were the earlier letters better or worse? Zorfax and the assistant exchanged glances, probably. I couldn't actually tell where Zorfax was looking with those fully black eyes. It's just descriptive and functional, Zorfax said. It's not really bad or good. It might have been bad. He didn't seem to want to talk about it. Oh well, there wasn't much to be done about it. Are you capable of manual labor? The assistant asked. Well, I am an orc. All I got back was a blank stare. Assuming humans here are the same, I should be bigger and stronger than most of them. It was entirely possible that the lifestyle of a mage would have left me somewhat flimsy, but all that running was good for me, and I kept myself vaguely fit at least. We might be able to set you up with some sort of labor job, Basant said. Oh. I frowned. I was hoping I could be a hero or something. That's a, he looked towards Zorfax. Given the conditions of your arrival, there will be a period of time before you can be considered for hero work, Zorfax explained. You need character references and the like. I can't just have Malalial tell if I'm lying? I asked. I didn't know for sure if she had that ability, but I was trying to find out. Zorfax sighed, that wouldn't be sufficient, even if you couldn't try to get around the ability, since you know she can tell if you're lying. The world you're from might have very different ethics, so your own opinion on whether you are suited for hero-related activities isn't inherently reliable. Well, I can't throw a magic carriage anyway, so I might be too weak. Magic carriage? Zorfax's face shifted in a way that was hard to read. I presume you mean cars. Like we came here in? The box? I asked. That's an elevator. With the wheels. Oh, yeah. That, I nodded. You don't need to be able to throw a car to work as a superhero, Zorfax commented. In fact, it's highly discouraged to use civilian property as a projectile. Oh. There was one flung at me. By a hero? Zorfax asked, or by a villain? By an earth elemental. Seeing he didn't understand, I tried a couple other things. Rock golem? Some sort of animated stone creature? Zorfax nodded. I see. Well, if it was being tossed at you, it was likely the work of a villain. The hero caught it and threw it back though. That dashy side is not my job to deal with. Let's get you your papers. I ended up with a lot of papers. 
Basic Overview of Technical Devices, Important Laws and Their Relation to Superpowers, How Money Works, and More. Plus all the papers I had to sign and fill out to get an ID. Apparently it was temporary, but it seemed like it was real, oh, it just expired after. 3. How long does this last for? I asked. 3 months, Zorfax said. You can apply for a longer renewal or something permanent, but this is the one we can get you today. I read through all the papers before I put my signature on them. I didn't want to sign away my soul or something. I doubted Zorfax would do that, but someone could have snuck something into the papers. Mostly, it acknowledged my receipt of the pile of papers I had, and confirming I wasn't fleeing from any law enforcement. That was true. That wasn't why I'd stepped through the portal. Also, to the best of my knowledge I wasn't actually a wanted criminal in town, though they'd like to lock me up for an evening to teach me a lesson if they could. I wish I got experience for reading all of this, I sighed. It's lengthy enough to get a few levels. Don't we all, Zorfax said. Sadly it doesn't work that way. Is everyone cursed? I asked. What do you mean? Zorfax asked. Well, I have Curse of the Barbarian, so I can only get experience through, you know, fighting. But even normal classes improve a little bit with reading. Zorfax exhaled, slowly. Let me ask something I suppose I should have already, do you have a level? I mean, I sighed. I was kind of hoping. I'm only level 11. A low level like that made me sound like a lazy bum who didn't do anything since most people didn't understand how aspect of the barbarian really worked. I didn't see it brought up anywhere on these documents. You get experience to level up? Zorfax asked. Of course. That's how levels work. Ah, uh, I apologize. This is equivalent to asking about your powers, so you don't have to answer me. Zorfax tapped his chin. How should I say this though, people don't have levels here. Low-level people can throw around cars in this world? I asked. That was kind of terrifying. That means I needed even more levels to keep up. That's not what I meant. People just don't have levels. He looked at me. I looked back at him. I understood the words, but they didn't make sense. It was like saying people didn't have vital organs. Or a soul. Nobody has levels? I asked. There's the possibility that someone has a power that results in them having levels somehow, Zorfax conceded. But that would make them unique. In general, people don't have levels. How do you do things? We just learn to do them, and then do them. I frowned. That sounds awful. It would take forever to get good at anything. Zorfax shrugged, that's life. We finished up with all of the paperwork eventually. That included something about a temporary apartment which I determined was a place to live. I signed simple stuff about it like not destroying it and all that. It seemed quite reasonable, though if I did something wrong and had to pay for it. I didn't have any dollars. When I brought it up, Zorfax mentioned there was a soup kitchen nearby. I still had a huge pile of paper in front of me, including magical copies of everything I had signed for me to keep. I hadn't read all of the stuff about rules yet, though Zorfax did point out the section on use of superpowers. Apparently, I could have gotten in trouble for killing that guy with magic, even though I was defending myself. Maybe I should learn how to fight. And don't bring up the fact that I used to pick a lot of fights. Just because I fought a lot didn't mean I knew how to do it well. I was a kid, and I also had magic. Do you need something to carry all of that? Besant asked as I was getting ready to go. Nah, I got it. Fortunately, I didn't have much else in storage, so I didn't have to spend more points to expand the capacity. I just called upon the mana and stored the whole pile. Interesting. If I may ask, how much can you store that way? Some, I said. I see. Well, let me take you to your apartment. I'm sure you'd like a break from all of this. In the morning I will help you look into jobs you might do, having some sort of employment would be beneficial.
my apartment was nearby. Like, really close. I suppose that made sense, considering how the building was labeled extra, temporary housing. Basant gave me my key, which didn't look like a key at all, but was just a flat thing made of weird material. Make sure you bring it with you if you go out. Though if you do lock yourself out, talk to the people at the front desk. I nodded. There's a small kitchen here, no stove or oven for safety reasons, but there's a microwave, fridge, and freezer. I didn't know what any of those were besides boxes that he gestured to, but I assumed they would be in the technology notes. Bathroom and toilet in here, and the bedroom. Not luxurious by any means, he shrugged, but it's not meant to last forever. I looked around. I like it. It was bigger than my room by quite a bit. Thank you. You're welcome, Basant smiled. If you have any questions now I can try to answer them. Otherwise, extra is always open. Do try to read the papers we've given you first, though. People can get quite busy. With that, he left me with the key and a bag of toiletries. I wasn't sure what they had to do with the toilet, since the instructions on the toothpaste clearly indicated it was for use on teeth. Apparently, it helped stop teeth from decaying. I wasn't sure why I would need that since I wasn't old, but it seemed important enough to give it to me along with a room. I still had half a box of donuts and nothing to do, so I sat at the desk by the window. My room was about halfway up one of the massive towers, and it was my first chance to get a good angle on the city and the bay in the distance. It was an impressive sight. It was hard to believe people were living in every single building, though I could see a large number of cars moving about below that had to have people in them. I began to read through the papers. It was already getting dark, but I managed with the light from the moon and stars until I was halfway through the technology documents. Then I flicked a light switch. Amazing. I didn't need that much light, but having several sources of light in every room was even more extravagant than the best mages' towers I knew of. When I was too exhausted to continue reading, I threw myself into the big bed that was even taller than I was, so my feet didn't hang off at all. It was comfortable and soft and warm. This world was great, and if I was lucky, I would get in more fights so I could level up. Though maybe I didn't need to. Chapter 6 In the morning, I was briefly confused to wake up in a bed that wasn't mine, with quite unfamiliar surroundings. Then I remembered, I had come to another plane. Planet? World? Dimension was the word they had used. It didn't really matter what it was called though. It was a new place that wasn't terribly easy to get back from, in which I had gotten into two separate combats, one of them much shorter than the other. Not bad for a single day. Tello, no surname. Level, 11. Experience, 335. Storage, plus one. Firebolt, plus one. Shocking grasp, plus three. Grease, plus two. Force armor, plus four. Mage's reach, plus one. Translation. Remaining points, seven. When I'd woken up in the morning, I was level ten and had 270 experience. I leveled up when fighting the dire bats, or whatever the large bat-like creatures were. That meant the guy who'd hit me in the back of the head was worth less than five experience to take down. I wondered how an adult man ended up at somewhere around level five or six, but then I remembered. People here didn't have levels. Unless Zorfax was lying for some absurd reason. I couldn't even be sure I got experience from fighting him, since the bats could have also been enough. I was fairly certain the bats actually died, so I should have gotten full experience for them. But unless they were from my dimension, the dire bats shouldn't have had levels either. My stomach rumbled. I supposed it was time to make my way down and try to find where the food was. I'd already consumed all of the donuts from yesterday, since spellcasting made me hungry. Or perhaps it was recovering the mana that did it, but those were basically the same thing, since they went hand in hand. There weren't many ways to recover mana besides just letting it happen, and those that did exist were expensive, so I didn't really have a chance to learn about it. Nothing I'd read explained, either. 
A mage just regenerated a single point of mana, per 10 minutes, more or less. Enough to cast a first-level spell without any upgrades improving the efficiency. I remembered Basant's words and made sure I had my key on me as I left the room, though I had everything on me, except for leaving the empty donut box in the room. Of course, everything was mostly my clothes, a practical shirt and pants, since robes weren't much good for running or other physical activity. They mostly gained benefits when enchanted. I also had a pile of papers in storage and a few coins that weren't usable as money here in my pouch and that was about it. I'd just been going to town for a delivery, after all. Not that I owned much else, since most of the books I studied had belonged to Master Yuvathar. The operation of the elevator was simple enough. They hadn't covered them specifically in the technology overview, but buttons were easy enough to understand, and the arrows. The numbers inside reminded me that I still didn't speak or read the local language. Instead of immediately casting translation, I tried to puzzle out the numerals in front of me. If I recalled correctly, the single line was the first numeral. It seemed to be base 10 as well, which meant operations should be familiar once I knew the numerals. I pressed 1, hoping that would take me down to the first floor and not down one level. I was right. As I entered the lobby, I saw Basant with something in his hand. Was that a tablet? No, at that size it would be a cell phone. As he looked up and greeted me I cast translation again, expending three points of mana. Exactly three, without upgrades. I just realized we didn't leave any way to contact you, he said. You knew where I was, though, I pointed out. You could just speak to me. Unless you wandered off into the city, yes. I took a look at my points. Enough to learn the sending spell, but it was highly inefficient. Of course, having unlimited range made it quite valuable, though I understood cell phones were almost the same minus cross-planar functionality. I wondered if it worked across dimensions, too. It had been so long since I got more points I didn't have the luxury of thinking about things like that. But who would I contact? I supposed Master Yuvathar might be concerned about my absence, but I might need those points for something else. And, if sending worked, he could just use it to contact me. It might be a bit rude to force him to be the one to spend mana, but he had more of it and a much higher total number of points. It would be one eleventh of my total to learn it while six points out of a thousand wasn't much for him, but I also knew he already had the spell. We should get you a phone, Basant said right before my stomach grumbled again. After showing you to the cafeteria. It's nothing impressive, but it'll fill you up. I followed along after him to another nearby building. It seemed that Extra owned or at least worked with many buildings around the area. The cafeteria seemed to be just one level of one of the tall towers in the area, but it was on the first floor, so it was convenient to reach. You have your ID? he asked as we approached the front. There was a person with one of the devices that were used for paying money. Yes, I said. The ID was light, so taking it in and out of storage was cheap. There was a little bit of inefficiency there, since I didn't know exactly how much it weighed, so I probably overspent mana a bit, but a tenth of a point wasn't anything crazy. It appeared in my hand and I held it out to the person behind the counter. A human, but with green hair. I wondered what sort of magic caused that change, but of course, the answer was none at all. Maybe humans just had green hair here. Or they could have not been human, and just quite similar. The woman took my ID and scanned it in a card reader. I wasn't sure why it was necessary, because she could have just read my name on it. Unless she didn't speak common? Or English, I think it might have been called. Here you go, she said as she handed it back. So maybe she just didn't read. Maybe that was common, otherwise they wouldn't have mentioned the card readers as something common. I saw that zero dollars popped up on the payment thing, so I didn't have to worry about that. Phew, I commented to Basant. I don't actually have any dollars. Meals are included, he commented. At least in situations such as yours. As for money, we should be taking care of that today. You mentioned you were able to work. I nodded, that's how people get money, 
since dragon hordes are pretty rare nowadays. He seemed a bit confused at the comment, but I supposed that with a world like this dragons had probably been rare for a long time. I certainly didn't think they would just pop up in a big city like New Bay. Take a tray, he gestured. I did so, and a plate and some silverware too. I couldn't believe they had so much silver just lying around, then I realized it wasn't actually silver, but more like iron. It wasn't rusty though. That seemed like a lot of work to maintain, but they were mostly in good condition except some bent tines on the forks. It seemed the cafeteria was set up so that people could just go around and take food. As much as they wanted. You eat the same things as humans, right? Of course. I had donuts yesterday. That's a human food, right? Right, Basant nodded. Then stay in the area with these markings, he pointed to a little symbol. The other stuff probably won't sit well. I glanced over at the food in the other areas. It didn't look that bad for the most part, but when I walked past it smelled kind of weird. Some of it was goopy, too, but everything in the human area looked good. I took eggs and bacon and sausage and bread. I was going to be using at least half of my mana during the day, so I would need the energy. And if they didn't mind me taking as much as I wanted to eat, I could eat a lot. Basant took a more modest amount, but he didn't look so much like the physical labor sort. I had a few inches of height and probably fifty pounds on him, since he was just a dark-skinned human and not an orc. Did you manage to read through some of the papers? Basant asked as we ate. I read most of them, I said. The technology was, a lot. But light switches are amazing. After breakfast finished, Basant brought me to the parking garage, and we got in a car. They weren't magic, but technology, and they ran through the power of fire. It seemed interesting, but they were a bit complicated to fully understand after one day. They worked, though, so that was all that mattered. I tried to keep track of how we moved about, but the streets all seemed so similar. The only thing I could do was try to pick out some more recognizable buildings and remember their relative locations. There were street signs too, but we passed so many I couldn't keep track. We'll be stopping here for a moment, he said as he parked in an above-ground parking garage. There weren't many of those that I had seen, but it had the lines for cars. We were in front of a collection of small buildings with different names. We walked into one called New Bay Cell. It stood for cell phones, obviously, and not containment facilities. After a short conversation and Basant handing over some cards that didn't look like my ID, I ended up with something in my hand. What is this? I asked. A cell phone, he said. It's not flat. Only smartphones are like this, Basant clarified. An intelligent object? I asked. They had a lot of them on the walls. It was strange to think that all of those might be able to think to some extent. And why would they be flat? Uh, Basant shook his head. I don't know that they're actually all that smart. They just have more features. Yours can still call people though. Speaking of which, here's my work number. The phone in my hand made a noise, and text popped up on the small screen. So I typed this number to contact you? I asked. Well, you can just hit reply. It took him a few minutes to explain how to operate the phone to me, but I thought I learned fairly quickly. I wasn't stupid. Just new to technology. I learned about replies and texts and saving numbers. I hadn't even considered that sending letters might be more efficient than sending spoken word. I wondered if that worked with magic or not. Spells had pretty fixed things they did, and usually you could only remove features to make them cheaper in terms of mana. I almost wanted to test it, but once again it would have been all of my points and a full hour's worth of mana to try it. Basant was quite efficient, taking me to another building after that. Normally you'd take a shuttle from the apartments, he commented. But since it's your first day and I had to get you a phone, it was easier to drive you. Thank you for paying for that, by the way, I said. Extra's paying for it, he pointed out. And it's cheap junk. It looks more durable than yours, I commented. Durable can be cheap. 
here we are. We passed by a person taking cards to get into another parking garage, and then we took a single flight of stairs to the surface. It's not an exciting job, but it's the sort of thing that we can set you up on short notice without knowing other skills. Welcome to Warehouse 7B. Is there something special about 7B? I asked. Nope, just a number. He stopped before he got to the door. Oh, I should warn you. Some people here will look, unexpected, if you're not used to people like them. Do try to be polite. As we stepped inside, I could see why he gave the warning. I was used to seeing humans and halflings and dwarves and various humanoids with strange shapes, but just like in Extras HQ, some people were less normal. Good morning, Florina, Basant said. Brought that new temp. Florina, it had to be Florina, because there was nobody else in the room, had three heads. One of them was a bird's head, one a dog's, and one a rodent's. At least, that was what they looked like to me. She had six arms, all of which were doing something and two of which were wiggly and bent strangely in all directions, and didn't really have fingers on the end either, but just coiled around things. Glad to see you, her voice came from the middle head, the dog. It sounded a bit rumbly, but understandable. Translation helped cut through an accent. We can always use another. Busy here. Two sets of eyes turned towards me, you're the new worker? I supposed she might have looked at a document, but I couldn't tell since I was trying to focus on the dog-like face, which seemed to be the most straightforward. Tello, right? You look strong enough. No experience operating a forklift, right? I knew how to eat with a fork. Was that operating a forklift? It didn't sound quite right. Is that, technology? Ah, right, she nodded with one head. Little experience there. Well, don't worry about it. There's not that much you have to handle, and I'm sure you'll pick it up quick. Mostly, it's just moving stuff around by hand. Thus began my first day working at a warehouse. I would have liked to say I was attacked by mutant rats or something, but there weren't even any regular-sized rats that I saw that day. Instead, I just carried around boxes, sometimes placing them in a truck, which was just a big car. At the end of the day, I got paid some dollars. A hundred of them, in fact. That, seemed like a lot. At least, it covered significantly more than a day's worth of food. On the other hand, I didn't know how much it took to stay in my apartment or anything else of the sort. It wasn't a terrible experience, but throughout the day, I wondered if I should increase my levels in storage so I could carry some of the small or medium-sized boxes without making my arms tired. And I didn't get into combat all day, so I earned not even a single point of experience. Still, I fell into my bed satisfyingly exhausted at the end of the day and tried to digest all of the new things I was learning. Chapter 7 The warehouse I was working in had two main sections. First was a part operated mostly by machines and people driving forklifts. Most of the larger boxes and things on pallets were kept in that area. The other sections involved smaller things that could be lifted by hand though the definition there varied widely. Some of that was related to the people who could lift things. There were three other people I worked with most of the time the first few days, with a few other people popping their heads in briefly. One of them I believe would have been called an alien, but aside from teal skin Asa didn't have any other strong distinctions from a human. Perhaps slightly different proportions, but as an orc I had both darkish green skin and tusks that made me more visually different. My next companion was just a human woman, as far as I could tell. Mary had pale skin and a medium sort of build. She was strong enough to lift anything we had to take care of, so anything beyond that didn't matter. Then there was Samira. It seemed she was a super, but she was working a regular job instead of being a hero or villain. I understood that supers were anybody with an unusual ability. Mostly humans, but then again even around extra, the majority of people were still humans. As for her ability, she was strong. She could carry around the boxes that were closer to belonging in the section with machines, while looking about the same size as any average human woman. Why are you not working as a hero? 
I asked. It was my understanding that hero work could pay much better than this job. Too dangerous, Samira explained. I don't have super durability or anything. Is that true? I questioned. You look pretty durable to me. I feel like I would break my fingers picking up those boxes. It's not much. Certainly not enough to stop a bullet, which kind of makes it risky. Dylans and criminals aren't always willing to play nice. That brought up more questions. What's a bullet? It was probably some sort of technology, but it hadn't been mentioned in the overview. Do they only have laser weapons where you're from? Asa asked. He had a fairly strong accent, but of course I didn't recognize any of the origins of them since they were all new languages. Translation helped me understand him almost as clearly as everyone else, though. Bullets are from slug thrower projectiles. A slimy bug-like thing being hurled at someone wouldn't go through even regular durability. Translation didn't help when a world meant multiple things. A sort of piece of metal? That could be dangerous if thrown at someone quickly. Like a sling. Was that what the gun thing the police had was? Ah, uh, I understand. Probably. The warehouse was quite tall and sometimes the boxes we wanted to reach were on the top shelves, 15 or 20 feet up. To reach those we were supposed to wait for someone operating some sort of lift thing, but it was slow. Way too slow. I eventually got tired of waiting for it and resorted to using Mage's Reach. Twice, so I could make use of each hand. Normally that would have been nearly six mana, a whole hour's worth, and that would put me in the negatives when adding on translation. However, while I didn't have the ability to boost the output of spells, I could limit it. In this case, making the hands more temporary, lasting about a minute, only took around a tenth of a point of mana, then it was just a matter of lifting the box. Mage's reach was sometimes disfavored by other mages because of its reliance on the muscle power of the caster. Quite a few mages didn't get much exercise, but I got plenty. Plus I was an orc which made me a bit bigger and naturally stronger than a human. The box came up, and then down. At a normal speed, of course. I didn't want to drop it. It was basically the same difficulty as just holding it in my arms for a few seconds, and then I was actually just holding it. I turned to bring it to where it needed to go when I saw Samira watching. She held a box under each arm and sort of casually leaned against one of the shelves nearby. You're a super too, huh? Then let me ask, why aren't you a hero? If you're so keen on the idea. That's simple. I just got here a few days ago. They didn't just let people go straight into heroing. They had to have background checks, which kind of required having a background. Since mine was currently appearing through a portal and getting into a fight, it wasn't much to look at. Oh, you're not afraid of getting hurt? I shrugged, that depends. Can normal humans survive getting shot? Yeah, sometimes. Then I should be fine. Force armor was able to resist a certain amount of energy, and it really didn't concern itself with how it was distributed. And I wasn't just going to suddenly level up if I didn't get into fights. The more real the combat, the better. Can those hands stop bullets? No. I have a different spell for that. Spell, like magic? Is that what your power is based on? It's just magic, I said, though I wasn't sure if there was much point in distinguishing between magic and a power. Sounds useful. It would be more useful if I were stronger. Since apparently people didn't know about levels here, just talking about strength seemed most appropriate. I had to admit that my first day in New Bay had significantly biased me on the amount of violence in the city. After a week, I hadn't seen anything swarm out of portals or had anyone hit me on the back of the head. To be fair, the second one had been a bit more disconcerting. I hadn't seen it coming at all, and I was just lucky that I always kept force armor active. It basically lasted all day for a small amount of investment, with the caveat that it would still break down under sudden force. Most of the time it just wasn't doing anything. On the weekend I got offered overtime. Apparently, it was a busy season, 
and since they offered extra pay and I really had very little else to do I accepted. I'd already read through the piles of papers I had been given, and I wasn't willing to spend my money on entertainment just yet. I was still scoping out the prices to make efficient use of my money. I did buy a box of donuts once though. Totally worth it. Overtime work was exactly the same as normal work, but with fewer people around. Samira was still around though. They lured you in, too, huh? she asked. I shrugged. Don't really have a lot of money. I hear ya. I get paid extra for my capabilities, but being a super takes a lot of upkeep. Unless you're the lucky sort who gets powers that draw from some source other than calories. Calories were food, and my magic at least partly required that. I've been eating a lot, I concurred. Translation magic is harder than you think. You have translation magic? I nodded. I don't actually speak English. Somehow that's cooler than just having a translator device. She shifted and switched the way she spoke. Does it work with Arabic? It took my brain a second to process the unexpected change in languages. Apparently it does, I answered in what I thought was Arabic. Cool. We continued to work until evening. It was tiring work, but we got regular breaks so it wasn't all that bad. Just around the time we were about to wrap up and go home, there was a bang. It was quite startling. It wasn't the same as if someone dropped something. Samira looked towards the sound. Then it happened again. Oh crap. I think that was a gunshot, she pressed up against some of the shelves. Really? Let's go look. Are you crazy? She half whispered. Right, sorry. I reached out to place a hand on her shoulder and gave her force armor. I also made sure to replace mine. A brief outline shimmered around each of us as I cast the spell. We have force armor. Now let's go look. I started walking, and Samira followed after me. I heard the sound of shouting and people walking. As we approached the front of the warehouse, it was possible to see some people through some empty gaps in the shelves. I saw a couple men holding guns, and Florina. The manager and her various heads were lying on the floor, and I saw a red pool of blood forming. Was she already dead? I hoped not. All right guys, said one of the men. You know what to do, we head for the target and silence anyone along the way. Five other people stepped into view behind the man as they started moving. That doesn't sound good. Samira whispered. We should hide. What about Florina? And they're heading towards some of the others, I think. I kept my voice down but started moving along the shelves to try to keep pace with the men with guns. I summoned Mage's Reach, with full power so I wouldn't have to worry about it randomly fading away. I just recently recast translation so. 1.67 times 2 plus 2.86 plus 3 is equal to 9.2, which left me with 3, almost 4 uses of shocking grasp. A firebolt inside this warehouse, with cardboard boxes a brown, papery sort of material, was a recipe for disaster. And shocking grasp was better anyway. I sent my reach through the shelves, a floating, cloudy hand reaching out towards one of the people. They weren't moving particularly fast, so it wasn't too hard to grab someone on the arm. Of course, I wasn't trying to stop them from moving. But shocking grasp did best with a sustained connection, so grabbing onto someone was best. Upon being suddenly grabbed the person a woman apparently jerked her arm forward. I just let her pull the hand along because I didn't care where it was. A few moments later, she was on the floor, still twitching slightly. I sure hoped she wasn't dead, because Exter was still vetting my safety. I did hold back just slightly, unlike with the big guy who knocked me on the back of the head, man down, one of the others around her shouted. The five remaining people spun around, looking for a target. I managed to grab another one and shock them, before they noticed me peeking through the boxes. Then there were a lot of bangs. The good news was that the shelves and boxes blocked most of the bullets. The better news was that my force armor blocked most of the rest. 
The bad news was that the one that shattered the armor pierced into my leg. I was trying to throw myself to the ground anyway, but that made it more of a flop. The only thing I could think to do was cast force armor again. That left me with a single shocking grasp and basically nothing else to take out four people. A few more shots fired at where I had been, but I lay still on the ground. Then I heard some yelling and more shots. Most of the voices were the intruders, but one of them was clearly Samira. It would have been nice if she shouted something poetic, like, how dare you hurt my friend, but it was just noise. I pushed myself up off the ground in time to see her punch someone in the chest. They had some sort of armor, at least that was what their bulkiness implied to me, but it wasn't able to just negate the impact. They were sent flying. There were more gunshots, and Samira staggered back. I saw the force armor break as she did so. That snapped my mind into focus for long enough to shocking grasp the leader, who seemed to be fumbling with his gun, dropping something out of it. I wasn't sure what he was doing, but I saw a clear intention to shoot more. He spasmed and toppled over as I pressed Mage's reach to his face and leaving it horribly blackened. Whoops, forgot to hold back on that one. There was a brief moment as Samira swayed on her feet and the remaining two intruders held out their guns. Then she stepped forward. I heard clicking sound, but no more gunshots. She grabbed the two of them by the head and bashed them against each other. They were both wearing helmets, but I heard a very loud thud as they impacted, and something cracked. Then Samira fell to the ground. I inhaled sharply as I started to move. I hoped I hadn't given her false confidence with my force armor, making her risk herself. I was right about it stopping a bullet, I just hadn't realized how many they could shoot. I had to call for help. Call, that was what a cell phone did, right? A few moments after I punched in his number, Basant picked up. Tello. How are you? People with guns showed up at the warehouse and shot Samira and Florina. And me, but whatever. I need help. I understand, Basant said. I'll make the call. Next time I'll talk to you about that later. Stay safe. Help should arrive soon. Then the sound went away, and it said the call had ended. I was pretty sure I was safe. I didn't have any mana left, and would you believe it I hadn't even leveled up, but Samira and Florina needed my help. I couldn't learn healing magic, but I could at least. I don't know, bandage them or something. And make sure that none of those people were going to get up. Chapter 8 The first thing I did after calling for help was stagger around securing the guns. I avoided going close to the unconscious intruders, not willing to risk them faking it. Fortunately, the ones still holding their weapons had very limp grips as I picked the weapons up with Mage's reach. I didn't really have a place to store them, so I bundled them up in my shirt. Samira was still close to two of the intruders, having bashed their heads together. When I bent down and grabbed her ankle to start dragging her, she groaned. Help me up. As I turned her over, I could see blood flowing from two wounds in her chest. It looked pretty bad to me, but I had very little practical experience with combat and wounds. And we couldn't just leave her next to enemies that might wake up. Likewise, I couldn't just kill them. Didn't want to and shouldn't, at least. I was probably physically capable, even with an injury in my leg. They were unconscious after all. The thought of whatever experience that might give was easily ignored. If they died while fighting I wouldn't feel that bad, but I wasn't just going to strangle unconscious people. I helped Samira to her feet, and once she was standing, she was almost more steady than me. We walked forward towards the front of the building. Florina was still laying on the floor and it didn't seem like we would be able to move her. Neither of us could lift her, and we couldn't really walk much further. I wonder how long it will take for help to get here, I pondered to myself as we flopped ourselves down near Florina. I dropped the bundle of guns and began ripping off strips of the shirt to bind our various wounds. I couldn't really get anything wrapped around Florina, but I used Mage's hand to just hold a piece of cloth on the bloodiest area. It was probably good news that the amount of blood seemed to be increasing, right? That meant she still had more. 
It wasn't long after that before one of the front doors was flung open, revealing Malalial, carrying a sword, with a gun strapped to her belt. I kind of expected her to be wearing armor as well, but the winged woman still wore a buttoned shirt and pants. Her eyes swept across the situation before running towards us. You're injured, she said as she stopped near us. They got shot, I gestured to the other two. I understand, Malalial said. An ambulance is on the way. The intruders? Back there, I said. We knocked them out and I took their guns, but I don't know if they had other weapons. Got it. Malalial held up something that hadn't been explained but was clearly a piece of communication technology with how she used it. It was a lot less compact than a cell phone and made a faint buzzing noise. Just arrived at the situation. It should be secure in a moment, with that she ran off. I kind of expected an angel to use healing magic on us, but perhaps that was unreasonable, considering they didn't really have magic here. Just powers, and it seemed angels didn't come with healing. Or she was more concerned about the intruders. Either way, it wasn't long before a loud siren sounded outside. People with uniforms and guns poured into the warehouse, wearing badges that said extra. Some of the guns were much bigger than the ones I had piled next to me. Those would be rifles, probably, while the ones by me were pistols. I really didn't want to get shot with them. Right behind them came a handful of people without weapons, and the designation of paramedic on some of their differing uniforms indicated they were healers of some sort. Just as they were talking to me, I felt the effects of translation fading. They said something about Pulse as one of them kneeled next to Florina and touched her neck. Then she was carried away. Samira was answering questions as more people looked over her. Then one more came to me. All right? Like, leg injury. Get the bullet out. Okay, got it, I nodded. I hadn't realized that the bullet would still be inside me. I used storage and indeed felt the bullet disappear. Then I used it again and held it in my hand for the medic to see. There, got it. Then I passed out. It turns out blood loss and mana exhaustion do not go well together. I was quite pleased when I woke up again. Not because I thought I was going to die. I was pretty sure I would survive, though once again I had little experience with wounds. The pleasant part was waking up in a sunny room with vaguely pleasant surroundings. I couldn't say the bed was the most comfortable I'd been on, since it wasn't as good as the apartment I was staying at, but it was better than many I'd been on. And I wasn't restrained at all. That meant they had probably decided that I hadn't gone too far with my magic. I was pretty sure I hadn't killed anyone, but who could know when people didn't have levels? Tello, no surname. Level, 11. Experience, 383. Storage, plus one. Firebolt, plus one. Shocking grasp, plus three. Grease, plus two. Force armor, plus four. Mage's reach, plus one. Translation. Remaining points, seven, still not enough to reach level twelve. Though I was pretty sure I had been at three hundred and eighty-one before passing out. I couldn't guarantee that, though. The worst part was how close it was. I only needed 390. If I could have defeated one more of the intruders myself, they gave about 12 experience each. I honestly wasn't sure what dictated that since if they didn't have a level I kind of expected nothing. At least the guy who hit me on the head was big, so him being worth something similar to a level 5 made sense. Maybe fighting people with guns made them around level 10? though it felt more like each bullet was stronger than a firebolt, which was just unfair. I couldn't believe I'd forgotten to try anything with grease. If I could have slipped up two people together I would have saved myself a lot of trouble, though really that also meant not knocking out one of them directly. Overall, I thought I did well enough in the battle. And I remembered to use force armor on Samira, so at least I'd thought about something there. After my assessment of the battle, which rated it a good enough assuming Samira survived, I took more specific stock of my situation. There was a pouch of clear liquid going down a tube into my arm. I wasn't sure what that was for, 
but I didn't want to pull something out of my arm and cause more bleeding. As I was wondering about that, a thin man walked into the room with a neutral blue outfit on, carrying a flat thing with some paper attached. He began to say something, but I held up a finger. I approximated my internal mana stores. Nearly full. That was good news, but also meant I had been out for at least a few hours. I cast translation. Sorry, I didn't have translation magic active. Can you repeat that? Of course. I was just saying it was good to see you awake. I'd like to make an assessment on your condition. How are you feeling? My leg hurts. That's not unexpected. The medics worked on the understanding that your anatomy functions similar to a human's, but we couldn't be sure how painkillers would affect you. Any dizziness? Lightheadedness? Maybe a little. Any other symptoms? No? No. Good, the man nodded. Any questions? Why is there a needle in my arm? That's for intravenous fluids, the nurse answered professionally. I couldn't tell if he thought it was a weird question or not. Why is the liquid clear? Blood is red. You didn't lose too much blood. This is just to restore balance while you were unconscious to help with recovery. I didn't really understand that, but I wasn't a doctor or anything. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you feel up to talking with someone else? Zorfax wanted to meet with you. My stomach growled. Can I have something to eat first? The man smiled. Sure thing. Hospital food was kind of bad, but at least it filled me up. An apple and a sandwich and some juice made me feel better. The small Zorfax sat nearby while I devoured it all. Normally this isn't my job, he said after I finished, but they figured a familiar face would be best and Malaliel is busy with other things. He looked down at the tablet in his hand, instead of paper notes like the nurse. Just a few questions. You're first to wake up. What do you remember about the attack on the warehouse? I heard loud sounds. Shooting. I saw Florina bleeding, is she? She's in intensive care, Zorfax said. But they're hopeful about her chances. Samira is out of surgery and recovering. Okay. I realized after a few moments that I should continue. After the shots, I cast force armor on Samira and myself and saw the intruders through the shelves. They were talking about silencing anyone on the way to whatever they wanted. I paused, they meant killing people, right? Probably, Zorfax said. Did any of them die? Two of them have bad head injuries. The other three were in a somewhat better state, though they'd clearly been electrically shocked, and that comes with complications. I presume that was you again? I couldn't really hold back. Wait, three others? Yes, five total. There was another one, I said. Six. It should match the number of guns as well. Is that so? Zorfax said. I'll make a note of that. Someone might have escaped. Anyway, I took down four of them with Mage's reach and shocking grasp, but they shot at me. I probably would have died if Samira hadn't come up on them and knocked two of their heads together. She got shot for that, and the force armor didn't help enough. Maybe it did, Zorfax said. They said the bullets were fairly shallow. Zorfax sighed, you sure seem to attract trouble. Like a real super. I'm just a mage though. He shrugged, powers are powers. And yours seems quite suited for combat, if you can take out a handful of people with guns. I can't really protect myself from them, though. I did strongly consider putting my remaining points towards two more levels of force armor though. That would make it about 10% stronger. A little less. Or I could aim for a more powerful defensive spell, but it would likely take all of my points. Though I would barely be able to afford to cast it. If it cost six mana, it would require me to recover for a full hour, and I only had 16 points at the moment. If I had a few more levels and bigger reserves, I could think about it more. It seems to have worked well enough though I would suggest a Kevlar vest if you plan to get in more gunfights anytime soon. 
where can I get one? I asked. Is that the armor they were wearing? Can I have theirs? And the guns? Why would you get their guns? Zorfax asked. I defeated them in justified battle. It's only reasonable. Was it not? His face said it was not. Look, Zorfax said. I'll talk to the department about the Kevlar, given what's happened. But you'd need a license for a gun. Even if so far you've used your powers responsibly, it's still early. And Extra doesn't handle permitting of standard firearms in any case. Do you have other kinds of guns? Of course. But not in my department. And licenses will be much harder to get. You'd only be able to acquire them if you were working for a Merc company or something. How do I do that? I asked. Do what? Zorfax frowned. Get hired by a Merc company. That means mercenaries, right? They fight things? Yeah. Which is why I wouldn't suggest it, unless you want to get shot at again. I didn't want to get shot at, I just wanted to fight so I could level up. Zorfax didn't seem keen on the idea though, so I thought I would have to look up mercenaries myself later, somehow. It might be easier to get hired by them than to become a hero. Zorfax finished his questions about the incident, though the only thing they hadn't already figured out was that there was a sixth gunman involved. After that, I was left to sit bored in my room, waiting to heal. Then I spotted a television, and next to me on the table a remote control. I just had to figure out how to make the latter control the former. Chapter 9 Two people in nicely tailored suits, a man and a woman, sat together at a large table, a pile of papers in front of them. The woman had brown hair and tan skin, sitting up straight as a spear. This just in, she said, shooting star saves a train with brake failure. What do you think of that, Zlatan? Behind the two of them was a large screen, playing images of a woman with blue-white hair and of course a form-fitting bodysuit and mask. She was flying through the air among various skyscrapers, or shown fighting various different sorts of things. A blue glow shone around her as she flew, and occasionally she would toss a ball of energy at something. The actual impact of the projectile was rarely captured. The man had seafoam green skin and yellow hair. As always, Gerda, I'm amazed by her ability to keep going. It's almost like she and her team are everywhere, keeping New Bay safe from every threat imaginable. Just yesterday, the Star Squad tracked down the last of the monsters that came through Dr. Doomsday's portals. That's right. It seems like Shooting Star is on the rise. I'm glad we can feel safe with her protecting us. And now, for a word from our sponsors. Why? I asked. Why what? responded Samira. That was a good question. There were so many things. Why are they showing two people talking instead of the superhero? They're blocking the screen. And they don't even really show her doing anything. Well, they can't always show the impact of her attacks, Samira pointed out. Especially on anything, fleshy. Why not? People don't like looking at charred corpses. Fine, I acknowledged. What about her team? They didn't say anything about them. I saw lots of other people around when that Dr. Doomsday guy was doing stuff. Well, I could hardly see some of them, but I was aware they were moving around. Some fast guy, and someone else flying that was clearly not shooting star. Plus obviously, the size-changing woman. They're not all attractive women with good PR agencies, Samara said matter-of-factly. And most of those involved were mercs. So? I asked. Why don't they talk about them? Because people want to hear about heroes, those who selflessly protect the people of New Bay. Not people who do it for money. Heroes get paid though, right? By those sponsors and stuff? Absolutely, Samira said, but mercs won't even be deployed until they can secure a promise of payment. Nobody wants to work for free, I noted. How do you become one? A hero? Samira asked. Well, you've got the most important part one guess. Powers and stuff. But you'll never get a job without an agent. 
And you have to be willing to do crazy stuff sometimes, she shook her head. I'd never want to be a hero. Sorry for getting you shot, by the way, I inclined my head. That was the real reason I was visiting her in her hospital room, and she just happened to be watching that news broadcast. I didn't want to bring you into danger. I might have overstated my force armor spell. Not really, she said. It worked better than I expected. And, they were looking for us. We might have been able to hide, but they could have gone after someone else. So I'm not mad. I'm never going to become a superhero though. Why not? I asked, you did great. Took out two of them at once. Why not, she raised an eyebrow. Because I don't like getting shot at and ending up in a hospital bed. Even if. I'm not really hurt that bad. But how are you going to get dash I stopped myself. First, most people didn't need to fight to get levels. And secondly, people here in general didn't get levels at all. You don't want to get stronger? Fighting would still teach people things. Not really. I might have a power, but it's not good enough to make it as a super. I'd rather just live my life, you know? I didn't know, but I nodded anyway. My life had mostly centered around Master Yuvathar's goodwill instead of whatever I managed on my own merits. Sure, I did all of the duties required of me, but he could have easily gotten someone more, capable. How hard it's it for people to become mercenaries? I asked. Samira shrugged, it's pretty easy to join them as long as you don't have a criminal record, or much of one. But they get all the worst jobs. A lot of fighting and danger. That sounded perfect. I was out of the hospital within a couple of days. Apparently, the bullet hadn't hit anything important in my leg, though I still couldn't walk that great. I had a crutch to help me walk around. It seemed that New Bay had some sort of thing called healthcare that covered the costs of my stay. I didn't have that much money to begin with, so that was good. I wanted to go back to work, but in addition to still being injured, which would stop me from carrying anything that didn't fit in storage, the warehouse was closed. Florina was in a much worse state than either Samira and I were, and the incident at the warehouse was still being investigated. Nobody seemed to know what they had been looking for at least not any of those who had been left behind. The leader was gone. Basab remained extremely helpful, offering to help me get other work related to extra, but I had other plans. They had been very helpful so far, but I wouldn't really go anywhere just relying on them. I found my way to a PC cafe. I wasn't sure why there was a business designed around selling access to technology and also food and drink that would ruin technology if it got into it but they had to know what they were doing. Technology was powered by electricity, and I knew water and electricity didn't mix well. Thus, I wouldn't be ordering any drinks while there. I did have to pay for access to the internet and a computer. I sat down in front of it. Then I leaned back and looked at the people around me. I understood the general idea of a computer, but the two sorts of input devices were still new to me. One had a lot of letters and numbers, with the letters arranged seemingly randomly. Maybe that was how the alphabet went? I hadn't really studied that. People seemed to be able to type rather quickly, hitting many keys on the keyboard at once. They also clicked the mouse with great skill. I saw the cursor move around on the screen to exactly where people wanted it. I hoped nobody was watching me. I doubtless looked like a fumbling novice, unaware of even the most basic functionality of anything. Because I was. But at least I'd read about it. All I had to do was find an internet browser. Death Arena Rematch, Extra Guns, probably wasn't one of those. That would be a game? Maybe the one the person next to me was controlling. That game seemed to have guns in it. Though it seemed quite abstract, since holding a gun would be nothing like using a mouse and keyboard. The pictures seemed like they might be helpful, but it just seemed to be random shapes or forms related to the name of the thing. Mostly games, probably. That was what was most heavily advertised on the outside of the building. I saw something that looked like it might be an internet browser and I clicked on it. Nothing happened. I clicked again, wondering if I had been off target. 
I actually noticed something this time. It had changed the color of something. I clicked elsewhere, and it did the same. But nothing was doing anything. I clicked things one at a time until I reached the very bottom of the screen. When my cursor reached the bottom more icons appeared, and when I clicked those something happened. It was strange, because I'd seen those icons before, but it functioned differently. Even so, I saw something happen and then there was an area that said, search. That was what I wanted, with some fumbling around I figured out how to make it do things. There needed to be a blinking bar in the right area, before I could type letters, which I found one at a time. Then I had to tell it to enter them. That one made sense, but it complained a lot when I told it to enter things, before putting anything else. I searched for mercenaries and got a lot of definitions of mercenaries and pictures of people with guns. When I clicked on images, it also had pictures of people who looked like superheroes. That was what I wanted. I clicked on a lot of things to try to find something. Ultimately, I ended up on news websites. Some of them wanted me to sign up with an electronic mail address, but I didn't have one of those. Besides, I couldn't afford to pay to receive a lot of mail. I just wanted information. Finally, after an hour or two, I figured out that more information was helpful. New Bay Mercenaries got me more information, and when I searched for that and Dr. Doomsday I found a helpful news article about the events of when I came through the portal. Obviously it didn't talk about me, but it mentioned the Star Squad and other groups. I even saw a picture of the rock thing, and the woman who threw the car back at it. Information below told me she was Great Girl from the Power Brigade. I couldn't say much for their naming scheme, but they seemed to be a group of mercenaries who actually did stuff. That was what I wanted, and I managed to find their headquarters after only another 20 minutes of searching. Truly, the speed at which information could be accessed was astounding. The location was quite far, in a different part of New Bay. Even if I could walk at my best speed, it would take me a long time to get there. Fortunately, I was aware that people would take people to other places with cars for a payment. Everything worked like that, really. As I was walking out, I got punched in the face. I looked down at the person who did it. Yeah. A skinny man with glasses yelled excitedly until he looked up at me. He rubbed the back of his hand. Uh, sorry? I nodded. Apology accepted. While I could have taken the opportunity to get into a fight, I wasn't actually a crazy bloodthirsty orc. And after even a half-hearted apology, I had no reason to get into a scrap with a random person who hit me on accident. Even if he hit me pretty hard. I had to refresh my force armor, or I was worried it might break. I even got a point of experience for that, though it could have been a very small amount just finally totaling the next point. I was getting sick of black streets, gray concrete, and glass. From the outside the Power Brigade headquarters seemed like it would be much of the same, but inside it was marble walls, floors, and pillars. Very fancy looking. Before I could go up to the desks, I had to pass through some sort of checkpoint with guards. Please take any metallic objects and put them in the bin. That was said to the people in front of me, so I was quite ready when it came to my turn. People seemed to walk through without issue, and then they just handed the stuff back. It seemed odd. I didn't really have anything metallic, except my cell phone. I put it in the bin and walked through the little gate. It had to be some sort of scanning technology. I walked through, and it made a beeping noise. Was that good or bad? We have another line for powers, the guard said, pointing. Oh, sorry. The guard shrugged. It's Express got an ID? I did. With license to use powers and everything. Though it was pretty vague about that. The actual restrictions were outlined in the long list of laws I'd read through. In short, it was a bad idea to use powers for crimes. Not that I intended to. The guard looked at my ID and waved me through, where I picked up my cell phone. I realized I hadn't taken my coins out of storage. Maybe they didn't care about that, or maybe there was a security vulnerability. I decided not to bring it up. 
I clicked my way one foot and one crutch at a time towards the desks with people waiting. There were enough people I didn't have to wait in line, and got to see someone right away. You have a request? The man behind the counter asked. Security, extermination. We do everything. Ooh, extermination sounds good, I nodded, very well. What do you need us to clear out? I thought I would be the one doing that. Oh. I'm here to join. Is that so? He looked over me, professionally not commenting on the crutch I was holding myself up with. You have a power? I nodded. I'll talk to our recruiter and set up an appointment. Ugh, did that mean I would have to come back later? I hoped my face didn't show anything, though I'm sure my tusks stood out more with my expression. He was focused on the screen in front of him though. Typing on a keyboard, quite quickly as well. She's actually free now, if you're available. Absolutely, I said. Very well, the man bowed his head. He typed a few more things. Come with me. He led me to another elevator. I wasn't surprised, since everything had elevators. However, this particular building had quite a few more basement floors than I thought it would. He swiped a keycard in front of a scanner before pressing B5. The first thing I saw was something that looked like an archery target, with more of them lined up along the wall to either side. A woman with medium-toned skin walked towards us. She wasn't wearing a hero mask, but her clothing was reminiscent of the same. Form-fitting, though less colorful, than others I had seen. Practical, maybe. This the one? she asked. The receptionist inclined his head. Yes, Matley. I haven't done the paperwork yet since you said you wanted to see him right away. She waved her hand. We can deal with all of that later. Once we know if it's worth the time. She looked at me. So, you got a name? Tello, I said, extending my hand for a shake, that almost destabilized me because I forgot I was holding a crutch with that arm, but it worked out. Well, I'm Metley. I know everyone's all secret about powers and stuff, but if you want to join the power brigade, you have to show me what you can do. The more you can do, the better pay we can offer. After a background check and all that, of course. I didn't really have a background. Um. I'm extra-dimensional. So there's not much to see. Really? She shrugged. Clean record then. Should be easy. She stood there for a moment. Well go on then, show me. Unless you're a speedster with a bum leg? A speedster? I didn't wait for an answer and shook my head. I got it. The first thing I did was pull a stack of papers out of storage. Storage, I commented. Interesting. I'm sure we could find something for that. Is that all? Of course not, I said. I looked over at the target. Is that flammable? She shrugged. Fire resistant. But if you can set it alight, it's fine. I stepped forward. My aim wasn't so good I could just do this from across the room, and there was a clear barrier they obviously expected people to stand behind. I held out my hand and shot a firebolt at the target, striking slightly off-center. It really didn't catch on fire, though I scorched some of it. Want to see more? You have more? She raised an eyebrow. I'll see it all. Chapter 10 Demonstrating storage was easy and safe. Firebolt had a target. Shocking grasp didn't really look like much unless it did something to someone. I held up my hand, letting electricity crackle around it. Shocking grasp. More or less twice as powerful as my firebolt, but obviously limited in range. Metley nodded. Interesting. Though with that said, I conjured up Mage's reach. It was a ghostly white version of my hand, though the details were so vague it could really have been any hand. I can extend the range with this. I moved the hand around, eventually shoving it into the target. The hand can also pick stuff up. Though it might seem foolish for a mage to give away all of his secrets, I wasn't being as incautious as it seemed just for the sake of money, or even opportunities to level. 
I needed to impress her so that I could get hired properly, and holding back wouldn't accomplish that. I waved my hand, creating a black film on the ground. I crouched low and moved across it. Grease was kind of disgusting, but also kind of fun. I continued to slide across the floor beyond the ten-plus-foot patch. Good for incapacitating people, I said. I waved my hand again to dismiss the spell, though I'd made it very short in length, to begin with. It was cheaper that way. I wasn't made of mana. And, temporary. I held up my arms and gestured to my front that was no longer coated in black goop. I was so glad it was temporary. An invisible armor made of force that can stop bullets. I didn't say how many bullets, but that was also a slightly different number than it had been. I spent my free points on that for more upgrades, since I wanted to be alive for more future things. Anything else? Metley asked. She looked impressed enough, not questioning me to see if I had anything good, but just wondering where my abilities ended. I hoped I read that right, anyway. That's it. Oh, besides translation magic. I don't, actually speak English. Translation, she looked interested. How does that work? One language at a time? It works with anything. Anything? Do you? She swapped languages. How is the? Can you repeat those last two sentences once more? Do you mean anything? How effective is the translation? Quite good, I replied in whatever language she was speaking. But, rare languages, are harder. I didn't need to explain more than that. Translation actually more or less copied the understanding of the people around me. It wasn't just those immediately with me, but if nobody in the world spoke a language it wouldn't do much to translate it. Okay. And that's the end of your abilities? Metley asked. Currently, yes. I might be able to learn more. That was a gross understatement. There were tons of things I could pick up easily assuming I leveled up again, but I wanted to define my own growth. And I thought I should probably keep some secrets. Great, she said. You know what we do here, right? You're willing to engage in combat with supervillains and their minions? You mentioned bullets after all, she said, looking at my leg. Absolutely, I said. I understand combat will be part of my duties. Wouldn't do me much good, otherwise. Then you're hired, she said. Really? I asked. Don't you have to do a background check and stuff? Are you a murderous psychopath? She asked. No? I answered. I wasn't a psychopath, and I hadn't killed a single human, so I couldn't be a murderer. Whatever those bats from that hell portal was weren't people, so they didn't count and it wouldn't have been murder even if they were people. Then it should be fine. Though, she admitted, I suppose we do have to finish those checks. They'll take a few days, but it seems you might need it for your leg. If you don't mind my asking, how did it happen? It seemed lying wouldn't be helpful. I was working in a warehouse when some people with guns came in. I got shot fighting them. And you still signed up to be a merc? She nodded. That's the kind of attitude we like here. She pulled out a tablet, I was still learning all the names for these things, but those were the bigger versions of smartphones, which were, more computery versions of regular cell phones. She started to input stuff. Do you have any references? Anyone you know, who could vouch for you? Uh, maybe a few people from Extra? Zorfax and Malalial, maybe. At least they shouldn't make my position any worse. And Basant. I heard the sound of the elevator behind me. I was beginning to recognize that particular sound. You know Malalial? Not much? She just was involved with getting me accommodated. I see, Metley said. Should be interesting. Since you came through extra, there will likely be a few other questions, but I don't really need to know about that personally. I don't suppose you have references from inside the Power Brigade? The elevator dinged. Not really. I'd been on Earth for a grand total of less than a week. I barely knew anyone. Except. Well, I did see Great Girl. We fought an Earth Elemental together. 
or, at the same time? She did most of the work, throwing that car at it. Sophia threw a car at something? Metley asked. Hey! A voice called out from behind me. I turned to see a vaguely familiar figure. Metley, you're not supposed to just casually throw out civilian identities like that. Metley shrugged, you don't have a mask on, and he's likely going to be hired to the power brigade. It's not a big deal. I recognized the profile of the woman now. It was just the smallest I had seen it. Her six-foot-tall form, instead of the increasingly muscled figures of her larger version. And the mask didn't really conceal her face. Great girl was quite recognizable. She looked over me. Hey, you're that orc right? She covered her mouth. Air, er, sorry. About what? I asked. I am an orc. She breathed a sigh of relief, oh good. You looked like one, but, you know. I didn't. Anyway, you really want to join the power brigade? I suppose it's a better idea than just wandering into an area with monsters pouring through portals. I thought you were just a poorly trained rookie, but it seemed you weren't even that, hmm. She held out her hand for a handshake. I guess we can officially meet. I'm Sophia, also known as Great Girl. I nodded. Tello. About that superhero name, Dash. I didn't get to pick it, all right? That's the Power Brigade's thing. And uh, she looked around conspiratorially, whispering, they're bad at it. They just pick an aspect of your power and throw on some sort of other descriptor. She rolled her eyes, I'm a woman, so I got girl. And I got great, because it means big. I can't fault the minimal logic behind it, I shook my head. I wonder what sort of name I might have. She shrugged. I don't know. What do you do? I saw a couple things, but I was busy wrestling that rock monster and definitely not throwing a car. But if I had thrown a car, it was thrown at me first. Metley rolled her eyes, I'm not going to rat you out to the financial department. I'm sure the owner of that car had super insurance anyway. I hope so, Sophia said. Anyway, Tello, you did a fire thing? And some slippy thing? I nodded. I'm a mage. So those are pretty standard. Mage, she tilted her head. That's, something. Unlike many of the people who said that to me, I didn't get the feeling she was saying an orc couldn't be a mage. It was more of the general response of people in this world about magic and its whole thing of not existing. I guess that's a good name for a power set though. Can you shoot magic missiles? I shook my head. I didn't learn that one yet. I wondered how she knew that was a possibility. There wasn't much more to say between myself, Sophia, and Metley. Sophia confirmed that I'd been involved in the battle, but couldn't do much to assert my capabilities beyond that. Then I was busy with paperwork, though filling it out was difficult. I could understand it easily enough, despite its complexity, but I simply didn't have some of the information being asked for. Work history, well, they kind of wanted jobs that had lasted for more than three days. At least I had a name and mailing address, though I still didn't have an electronic mailing address. There were so many things I needed in this world that it would take a while to catch up. Maybe I would try to figure that out while I waited for a response from the power brigade. There was a small beep, causing Basant to pull out his phone. Not that he ever put it away for long. This particular beep belonged to a new contact who Basant had spent quite a bit of time dealing with lately. He might have been annoyed if the person in question hadn't been so pleasant about everything. I got an electronic mail address. Tullo at Baycorp.com Basant smiled slightly. Tullo was always excited about everything. Another message followed it. Still don't have a computer though. And then another. Also I applied for a job at the power brigade. Basant stood there for a few moments, looking at the last one. Tullo had just been shot, and then wanted to become a mercenary? He might actually be crazy. He didn't seem like a violent psychopath but there were always those who enjoyed a fight. He'd given a reason, but it didn't exactly make sense. Basant chose not to ask further, because it seemed related to his power, 
or his world. That was the sort of thing you ran into when working at Extra. Extraterrestrials were fairly decently catalogued, at least those that had frequent contact with Earth, but it was entirely possible that there were an infinite number of dimensions to draw extra-dimensional people and things from. Personally, Bassant thought it was far too easy to rip open holes to other dimensions, but with all the supers around it was really hard to say what made sense to begin with. While every power had a limit, they didn't always follow normal rules. Time to return to work. He should see if the power brigade had put in a request for information on Tullo. If they took him on, Tullo would become their responsibility. It wasn't that Extra didn't want to deal with him, but he had a propensity for getting into trouble and there was enough work for Extra to do regardless. They didn't have the resources to keep individual people safe. It was enough trouble just keeping track of people arriving in the area. Large cities drew in people like a magnet, and that included those who might not fit in elsewhere. New Bay was large and extremely populous, and the more supers, extraterrestrials, and extradimensionals that came to the area, the more likely more would come. New Bay was the biggest nexus of that sort on the West Coast. New Mass on the East Coast was the only bigger one in the States, and it was more than one city. A few moments later, he saw the power brigade had indeed put in a request for information on Tullo. Besant only had access to that information as his primary contact, he couldn't just look at Extra's databases on a whim. Not even the higher-ups were allowed to do that. Funnily enough, Tullo's file was fairly empty. Short, but dense. But everything that happened to him so far had ties to Extra, from the moment he'd been picked up by the police. Besant sighed. It was sad that the world still had people that would bash someone over the head just for having green skin and tusks and nothing else. While his own brown skin was slightly less targeted than historically, that was only because there were easier and more obvious people with differences. Of course, to some people humans were the strange foreigners, but at least most of those that ended up on Earth realized they should restrain themselves. Except those who became supervillains. At least there hadn't been any full-scale alien invasions for some time, with the multitude of species represented on Earth being a handy deterrent force.